into uh, order. Um, as we begin today's meeting, we'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the treaty territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the traditional territory, the Haudenosaunee, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other global Indigenous people they now call Brampton their home. We are honored to live, work, and enjoy this land uh, together. Please all rise for the singing of our national anthem, be followed by a moment of personal reflection. Thank you. Welcome to our regular council meeting of May 22nd, 2019. Uh, and sorry for the slight delay this morning. We had uh, an exciting announcement earlier today with CMHC and the federal government uh, that uh, Councillor Harkirat Singh and Gurpreet Dillon were quite involved in. And so we were coming from that announcement uh, of 90 new affordable housing uh, units uh, in partnership with the Bramley Christian Fellowship. and. We all know we're really working hard to make sure we deal with the wait list for affordable housing. So when we have partners willing to invest funds in the city of Brampton, that's a good news that you welcome, even if it's before the council meeting. Um, we, all members of council are present uh, today. Members of council, there are a few agenda changes identified on the package in front of you. I will ask the city clerk to review the changes for today's agenda since its publication last Thursday. Uh, Mayor Brown, members of council, members of staff, uh, these are the changes to today's agenda. Item 6.1, a briefing report from the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer regarding government relations matters. That is distributed on your desk this morning. As well, item 9.3, a report from Public Works and Engineering regarding a park naming to commemorate the Philippines national hero, Dr. Uh, Jose P. Rizal, which was a referred matters item from Committee of the Council last week. In addition, items that were uh, listed on the agenda for being just for, to be distributed prior to the meeting. Item 3.1, minutes from the City Council meeting, regular meeting of May 8, 2019. Uh, item 7.4, presentation from Hemson Consulting regarding the 2019 development charges study. Uh, those matters are published on the City's website. As well, items related to matters on today's agenda. In regard to item 7.1, which is a statutory public meeting regarding the 2019 development charges study. There are two pieces of correspondence identified as 13.2. The first is from the Building Industry and Land Development Association, dated May 21st, build. And the second is from um, Smart Centers, dated May 21st, uh, from Joseph Seimer. And representatives will be in attendance to respond to any questions in regard to their correspondence. As well, in regard to announcement uh, 5.1, Walk for Dog Guides, there is an event brochure that's been distributed to members of council. And finally, item 5.2, an announcement regarding the 2019-2020 The Rose Theatre Presents season. The season brochure has been distributed to members of council. Okay. Um, are there any other additions, changes, or deletions to the agenda? Uh, Councillor Pileschi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to add to the agenda uh, security in camera discussion, security of the property of the municipality or local board, and a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. 
21.4. Proposed item 21.4. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, both Councillor Medeiros and I would like to add a uh, discussion item on community youth hubs in Brampton. Be 17.6. 17.6, a new 17.6. Councillor Vicente. Thank you. Uh, actually, I believe Councillor Fertini has an item to add. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Councillor Fertini. Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm uh, just starting a discussion about a naming of a road. Uh, I think if you have, it was an email or something like a uh, motion. Yes, you have to state the yeah, subject. I couldn't find it. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe the proposed item is a ceremonial renaming of Midair Court in uh, honor, in memory, sorry, of uh, the CEO for Dynacare. Okay. So that would be proposed item 17.7. Okay. Uh, and I also have an item in terms of um, the 2019-16 RFP. So that would be, Mr. Mayor, item 17.8. Uh, seeing no other additions, we have a motion from Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Bowman, that the agenda of the regular council meeting May 22nd be approved as amended, published, and circulated. All those in favor? Motion carries. Pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any matter to be considered on today's agenda? Uh, yes. So, Councillor Bowman. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I declared a conflict last week on uh, um, an item, and it appears in this week's uh, approval of the minutes, 11.3, item CW208-2019, discussion on Carabram. And uh, the reason is my son does a, a bit of work on Carabram, so in abundance of caution, I am declaring a conflict. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. De I declared a conflict on my own from the planning committee on William, on William Street. Okay, thank you. Uh, the clerk will so, neat, so, will so note for the meeting minutes. We're now ready to move the next item for a public business on today's... Oh, sorry. The same reason as before. Uh, I believe the reason was uh, for direct interest. Direct pecuniary interest. Correct. Property, yes. Okay, the clerk has so... Noted in the committee minutes. We're now ready for the next item of public business on today's council agenda minutes. We have the following council minutes before us. I have a motion moved by Councillor Willens, seconded by Councillor uh, Bowman. The minutes of the regular council meeting May 8, 2019, to the council meeting of May 22nd be adopted as published and circulated. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, the items listed with an asterisk on the agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial. The consent motion is to adopt this matter on today's agenda without the need for a separate discussion on the item unless a member requests a separate discussion. Does any member wish to add an item or remove an item from the consent motion on the agenda? Uh, Councillor Bowman. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, seeing none... I have a motion from Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Bowman. And this is the Council hereby approves the following items that the various officials of the corporation are hereby authorized and directed to take such action as may be necessary to give effect to the recommendations. This is for 9.4, 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54, 9.55, 9.56, 9.57, 9.58, 9.59, 9.60, 9.61, 9.62, 9.63, 9.64, 9.65, 9.66, 9.67, 9.68, 9.69, 9.70, 9.71, 9.72, 9.73, 9.74, 9.75, 9.76, 9.77, 9.78, 9.79, 9.80, 9.81, 9.82, 9.83, 9.84, 9.85, 9.86, 9.87, 9.88, 9.89, 9.90, 9.91, 9.92, 9.93, 9.94, 9.95, 9.96, 9.97, 9.98, 9.99, 9.10, 9.11, 9.12, 9.13, 9.14, 9.15, 9.16, 9.17, 9.18, 9.19, 9.20, 9.21, 9.22, 9.23, 9.24, 9.25, 9.26, 9.27, 9.28, 9.29, 9.30, 9.31, 9.32, 9.33, 9.34, 9.35, 9.36, 9.37, 9.38, 9.39, 9.40, 9.41, 9.42, 9.43, 9.44, 9.45, 9.46, 9.47, 9.48, 9.49, 9.50, 9.51, 9.52, 9.53, 9.54,
Uh, registration is 9 o'clock. Uh, walk starts at 10. Um, we do have this year, for the first year, we have the fire department coming out. We have one of their trucks, I don't know which truck it'll be, where you can have a picture with your pooch and yourself and the fire department for a minimum minimal donation of $2. Like I said, the registration is 9 o'clock. Walk starts at 10 o'clock. We will be taking a little break because there is another walk that happens in that park the same day that our club is donating money to as well. So I hope to see you out. If you can't come out, please donate. Uh, as, as a few councillors know, last year we were challenged by Hamilton. We lost to Hamilton, unfortunately. They dropped the gauntlet again this year, guys. Come on. <clears throat> they dropped it again. We need to help. We need to challenge them. We need to uh, beat them this year. They only beat us by a thousand bucks. I'm sure we can get that this year with your help. So again, Sunday, May 26th, 9 a.m., Chinkuzi, Ski Chalet parking lot, registration, 10 a.m. walk. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Yes. I just wanted to say that uh, I grew up in this community. I'm from Brampton, went to Cardinal AJ High School down the street. I've been type 1 diabetic since I was 12 years old. And uh, almost five years ago, I was in a, a pretty severe car accident, which changed things for me. And uh, what it changed was I, I no longer have the ability to tell if my sugar level is going high or low. And that's where Dog Guides come in and Lions Foundation, who have uh, changed my life tremendously. This dog here has literally saved my life on more than one occasion. Um, <clears throat> my wife now allows me to take care of our small children uh, by myself <laughs> because she was concerned that, you know, maybe my sugar would go low and I would be incapacitated. So uh, Roslyn here and the Dog Guides people uh, who are based out of Oakville and the Lions Foundation community all throughout our country uh, have helped me immensely. <coughs> I'm a member of your community and you will see more and more of Dog Guides with people like you can step up and, and, and help us out, help us to, to make some money, earn some money, and get your constituents maybe to, to throw in as well. Are you okay with that, Mr. Brown? I'm sure everyone will be happy to be supportive. Appreciate that. Hi, Councillor Bowman uh, wants to add us in. <clears throat> thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Wes, Jason? Yes. Thank you very much for coming and uh, bringing Rosalind. We can't see her, but... She's a beautiful dog. Oh, <laughs> Maybe just she's, step her up on the stairs. She's, lay, she's laying down right it was, now. It was a lot okay. of hard work for me. Yeah, and uh, Wes, thanks very much for, for coming in today. Thank you very much uh, to the Lions. Um, there's, uh, both Councillor Willens and I have been involved uh, for the last four years in this walk. It's, uh, it's phenomenal to think that a donation can change a person's life in, in so many different ways. Um, the money that people donate, it could go to a hearing aid dog, there's a list of them here, canine vision dogs, seizure response dogs, service dogs, diabetic dogs, uh, autism assistants, and general support dogs. Um, it's a tremendous thing to, to be able to provide funds for one of these dogs. Can you tell me what does one of these dogs cost? I was just gonna get to that yep. actually. <laughs> Each dog, cost $25,000. Not one dime of that comes from, not one dime did Jason pay. Not one dime does our, our clients pay. We I pay it all. Though, just <laughs> so that's why we do things like this walk and other community events that we try and raise money for it. That's, that's excellent and, uh, and hopefully there's a lot of people here who can uh, blast it out on social media, a lot of people here who can join us at Ching Park. I know it's early, 9 a.m. on Sunday. Um, as Wes said, there is another event going on in the park at the same time, so uh, it's the Ski Chalet parking lot. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, I, I think Councillor Willen's planning on going again on Sunday. Uh, we will see you on Sunday, and hopefully we see some of the other councillors as well. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> he Thank knows you. I'm pointing at him. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, and the website, just so we can, sh anyone who wants to share on social media, the website uh, is um, www.walkfordogguides.com. 
Uh, and uh, if you want more information, you can call 1-800-768-3030. Or, you can, uh, or I do believe the pamphlets that you do have have a sticker on the front. You can give me a call, and I'd gladly give you any information you need. Okay, great. Yeah, the local um, Lions Club is 905-453-8693. I would note my office has been uh, invited uh, to over 20 charity events this weekend. Um, and so we do try to get counselors to attend all the different events. Uh, and this weekend happens to be a big one, but we'll, we always do our best to make sure every event we've got counselors or myself at. And thank you for um, being one of the many great groups that raise funds for great causes in our community. And thank you for being at our city council meeting today. And it's your birthday. It is my birthday on Sunday, and it is Council Fleshies as well. There you go. Oh, wow. Where are you two going? <laughs> <laughs> You have a dog? <laughs> okay. Um, our next item is item 5.2, an announcement regarding the 2019-2020 The Rose Presents season. Jocelyn Johnson, Acting Artistic Director, um, Manager Theatres, The Rose Theatre, is here today for an announcement. Welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, members of Council, Senior Leadership Team. I am so thrilled to be here this morning to officially share with you the 2019-2020 Performing Arts season, featuring the extraordinary artists who will grace our stage at the Rose from July of 2019 to May of 2020. This season is full of first-rate performances that will encourage you to gather, share, and connect while experiencing the creative vibrancy of Brampton and beyond in our extraordinary venue. Our season kicks off on July 4th with From Judy to Betty in the studio, and it's performed by Rebecca Perry, who is a Brampton native. Throughout the season, audiences will hear the world's best musicians, including Canadian indie rock legends Sloan, The Trues, Crash Test Dummies, Burton Cummings, and emerging musical talents such as Megan Patrick, Tanya Tagak, and Brampton's own Lydia Prasad. This year, our dance features include Juliet and Romeo, performed by Decidedly Jazz Dance Works, leading Indian dancer and choreographer Aditi Mangaldas, and a holiday tradition, the Nutcracker. <coughs> Families can look forward to Sesame Street Live, The Little Mermaid, and the final ever performance of Sharon and Bram. We are committed to highlighting local artists and partnering with local organizations to reflect, foster, and celebrate the Brampton community. We've partnered with The Fold, Brampton Concert Band, The Rose Orchestra, Brampton Music Theater, Sound Drive Records, Brampton's very own, and Be Jazz to bring the best of Brampton talent to The Rose. As a venue of choice for many artists and organizations, we are proud to introduce guest performances or guest presentations. These are the shows that are produced by the, our valued creative community and presented on stage at The Rose. You can check them out on page 56 of the brochure. To be sure that Brampton is always showcasing top-notch talent and taking advantage of every opportunity, we will continue to announce new shows throughout the season, adding to the excitement year-round. This also leaves room for our incoming Executive Artistic Director, Stephen Shipper, to add his vision to the season. We look forward to welcoming him officially on June 3rd. Current subscriber members can purchase advanced subscription memberships by phone beginning tomorrow until May 27th. Then new subscriptions go on sale on May 27th, and finally, single show tickets go on sale on June the 3rd. Current subscriber members can purchase advance, or sorry, as you see, there are lots of great shows to choose from, and we encourage you to put together your season. I look forward to seeing you soon at The Rose. Okay. Thank you, Jocelyn. I think there's lots of excitement for the season. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Santos with a question. Oh. <laughs> I really question more like a comment through you, Mr. Bear. Uh, just going through the program really quickly, super exciting. Uh, lots of great shows. Hoxley Workman is a friend of mine, and Joseph is Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I performed in that back in the day. So <laughs> thank you for putting together a fantastic program. Looking forward to the season. Thank you. Through the mayor, I don't think that the auditions have closed for Joseph. So <laughs> if you'd like to be back on stage. <laughs> thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much. Our next item is item 5.3. We have three proclamations. Um, the first, uh, I understand, um, are no longer with us, Nicole Goudreau and her daughter, Neva. I don't, are they here? I don't think they're, they're able to make it today, but they requested a proclamation uh, for Neurofibromatosis Awareness Day. This was an initiative that was started in 1985. May 17th is 
neural fibromaxis uh, worldwide uh, awareness day. And so we'll save this proclamation for them uh, and present it to them at a time that they're uh, available. We have two other proclamations. The first is May 30th is World Multiple Cirrhosis Day. And we have Brandy Easton from the MS Society of Canada, Peel Dufferin Chapter, and Kathy Hall, the Gordon, Golden Horseshoe Regional Director of the MS Society of Canada. Um, May 30th is World Multiple Cirrhosis Day. Canada has one of the highest rates of MS in the world with an estimated 77,000 Canadians living with this disease. The 2019 campaign is called My Invisible MS. To raise awareness of the invisible symptoms of MS and its unseen impact on quality of life. The aim is to challenge common misconceptions about MS and help people understand how to provide the right support to those affected. This MS Awareness Month, join us in raising awareness about the disease that affects so many Canadians. And so I've signed this proclamation. I'll present it to Brandy and Kathy. And if members of the council would like to join, they're welcome to. As you make your way back to your seats, I just wanted to take, thank you for the opportunity of proclaiming the month of May as MS Awareness Month here in the city of Brampton. As you've heard, Canada has one of the highest rates of multiple sclerosis in the world, and over 77,000 Canadians live with MS. On average, 11 Canadians are diagnosed with MS each and every day. Multiple sclerosis is classified as an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system. The immune system attacks the myelin, the protective coating of the nerves in the brain, spinal cord, optic nerves, <coughs> and it disrupts communication between the central nervous system and the rest of the, bo the body. The disease course of MS is often unpredictable. Uh, it often, do, though, does occur in a pattern of relapses and remissions. And in some people, however, though, the disease will steadily worsen from the diagnosis. There is currently no cure for MS, but treatments are available to manage MS symptoms and decrease the frequency and severity of the relapses. The MS Society, in terms of our mission statement, is to, to be a leader in finding a cure for multiple sclerosis and to enabling people affected by MS but to enhance their quality of life. Here at the Peel Dufferin Chapter of the MS Society, we offer information, referral, education and support in addition to funding to assist residents with needed mobility equipment. Last year alone, the chapter provided close to $20,000 to assist 35 individuals with MS in the city of Brampton with their equipment needs. Canada remains at the forefront of MS research and since the MS Society of Canada first started in 1948, we have invested over $175 million in research. There is progress has been made, but there is much work to be done. And so we certainly appreciate the City of Brampton proclaiming MS, uh, May as MS Awareness Month to help raise awareness about the disease which affects so many. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. We have one more proclamation. Uh, and th that will be presented to Dale Liang from Bike Brampton. Um, June is celebrated as Bike Month in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Bike Month brings together families, commuters, and community groups to promote cycling as a utilitarian transportation mode, as well as the recreational activity at hundreds of events throughout June. The kickoff to Bike Month will be celebrated May 27, 2019, with Bike to Work Day at Garden Square in downtown Brampton. 
Bike Month presents an opportunity to encourage those who live and work in Brampton to try riding a bicycle for everyday trips as well as for recreation and to realize the health and environmental and economic benefits of doing so. And before I present this proclamation, I just wanted to say obviously you have a council that is really excited about uh, enhancing active transportation in our city. That's why we made an allocation right away uh, from last year's budget and want to continue to grow that. Uh, a healthy city is one that is active uh, and uh, getting more people into uh, cycling is a great way to do that. And so May 27th, mark your calendars. We're hoping everyone uh, cycles to uh, City Hall or in the case of the fire chief, if you're going to the fire station uh, or to transit, we hope it's the one day for Brampton Transit. To, we want to see uh, everyone show up in bikes. Uh, so it's going to be a great day in the city and I'll present this proclamation once again if uh, council wants to join me as we present this proclamation uh, to uh, David and Dale. Mr. Mayor, um, members of council, um, staff, and uh, members of the public, on behalf of the uh, cycling community, and we have a couple of members, uh, other members in our audience who didn't were too shy to stand up today. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the council very much for proclaiming um, June as being Bike Month. Uh, cycling is a wonderful, both a wonderful recreational and uh, transportation um, uh, activity and efficient form of transportation. Um, cycling allows Brampton residents to build physical activity into their daily routines, reduces stress, the risk of disease, and improves mental acuity and community togetherness. Getting more people out of their cars and onto their bikes is an inexpensive and effective way of reducing the city's carbon emissions in the fight against climate change. Almost everyone can enjoy cycling, and there are many cycling events and activities planned for this, bike, this upcoming bike month including, as the mayor alluded to, um, Bike to Work Day that's happening this coming Monday uh, at Garden Square. A number of community rides which, which kick off actually this Sunday morning, and I'm sorry that we're going to conflict with, uh, with the event that's taking place at Chinkuzi Park. Um, uh, we also have TRC, we have partnered with the TRCA this year to, uh, to host a number of rides in the parks and conservation areas throughout Brampton. Uh, we have Cycle Fest once again taking place with the All People's Church on June 1st, and this time in support of Salvation Army. And um, we're very thrilled that um, as part of the Community Cycling Program with the Region of Peel, we're opening up the second location in Brampton for what we'll call the, Bram the Brampton Bike Hub at Ardlin um, at the Journey, and in fact, it's tomorrow night. Um, but there will be opportunities for, uh, for councillors to come and, and uh, join us at that later on this, this, um, this month, this summer. And of course, we have the, uh, the signature cycling event on June 22nd, which is Bike the Creek. Um, in its sixth year, I should say. And um, it's notable that, um, particularly in today's political environment, that um, all three Peel municipalities are working cooperatively to participate in bicycle-friendly communities um, and uh, to be part of this event. And um, Councillor Pelleschi, I would particularly remind you that um, Mayor Thompson was at the event, uh, not this, well, he was at this event last year, but also in previous years, and, um, and has once again put down the gauntlet, right? Uh, that um, he, he manages to get three of his council members out to, uh, uh, to participate in Bike the Creek, and again, they've committed to coming out in, in droves this year. And, um, Six. Six. <laughs> Six. Yes. Six. And so we would very much like to have 
um, per, um, council representation at Bike the Creek this year, and um, uh, and we hope to see you all there. So uh, it's, it promises to be a wonderful event. We've changed up the routes uh, for for this year, and there's uh, there's ride routes and links for everybody. So we're looking forward to seeing you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you very much for this proclamation. We really appreciate it. Oh, okay. uh, we have a question from Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm super excited about Bike Month this month. Uh, before getting, before becoming a councillor, I used to bike the creek every year with my family. It's a, an excellent event and looking forward to being there uh, on Monday morning. Um, as the member of the cycling committee on council, I'll be waving the flag and I believe there's a report coming forward for an update uh, regarding the big ask and what uh, we are going to be doing this year to increase active transportation um, in the city. This weekend, I was mountain biking up north with my son Lennon, and he is participating with his school in Bike to School uh, Week. And I believe there's a record number of school registrants this year with over 150 schools participating. So let's keep up the advocacy on active transportation and biking. You've got so many champions here, and I'll join Councillor Pileshi and challenge all of council to have 11 uh, for Bike the Creek this year. Thank you very much, Councillor. And I, I, sh I, I believe that the number of schools participating in Bike to School Week this year is over 190. Wow. So it's, um, it's increased dramatically this year. And um, the number of events that we are involved in, Bike Brampton are involved in, is more than doubled um, from last year. Hi, hmm. Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you. Uh, the Langs to uh, for coming. Um, I really wanted to thank you for providing the city of Brampton one of the greatest days of the year, and that's Bike the Creek. And I, I was there the the very first year where we had I don't know maybe a couple maybe a hundred couple couple hundred uh, just over hundred. To last year it was just. Well, last know, year I mean, we had a rain a, a rain problem, but, but it, it was, was still over over, over three hundred. Yes. Yeah. But, but the previous year we had over six hundred. Over six hundred, yeah. and it it is an amazing event. It really is. And unfortunately, Caledon continues to challenge Brampton, <laughs> and Brampton falls a little bit short. Unfortunately, um, it being in Brampton, uh, it's it's been at Jim Arch Deacon for uh, all six years. Or did we move That's one year? Correct all six years and um, it is a truly fantastic event so if everybody can mark in your calendars uh, Saturday June 22nd uh, one of the greatest days of the year uh, to come out to Jim Archdeacon and uh, let's let's show up that uh, that municipality to the north and see what Brampton can really bring thank, thank you, you very much thank you mr. mayor okay thank you councillor Pleshi and thank you uh, for joining us today Dale and David thank you mayor our next uh, item is government relations matters. Lowell Ruben Vaughn, Office of the CEO, is here to respond to any questions from Council. Do any members have questions regarding the information that was provided by Lowell? Seeing no questions for Lowell, um, then I have a motion from uh, Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Williams. The briefing report provided by the Office of the CEO to the Council on May 8th uh, be received. All those in favor? Motion carries. Our next item is 6.2, a memorandum from the Office of the CEO regards to the City of Brampton's draft responses to the Provincial Consultation Modernizing Ontario's Environmental Assessment Program discussion paper. Do any members have questions regarding the information provided? Seeing none, we have a motion from Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Willens, uh, that uh, it be received. All those in favor? Motion carries. Our next item is delegations. Today we have a number of delegations on today's uh, meeting. Our first delegation is a statutory public meeting held under the authority of the Development Charges Act to consider a city background study and propose new development charges for the city. We will start today with a presentation from the city's consultant, Henson Consulting Limited, be followed by receiving public delegations on this matter. After the public delegations, Council will consider the staff report, item 9.1. Uh, Andrew Mirabella from Hempson Consulting Limited is here to make a presentation in regards to the 2019 Development Charges Study. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Good morning.
morning. Thanks very much. My name is Andrew Mirabella, uh, Senior Consultant at Hempson Consulting Limited. Um, we've been obviously retained uh, by the city to undertake this uh, development majority background study and uh, put forward a proposed bylaw. Um, before we get started, obviously, just like to thank uh, city staff throughout this process, um, council and the development industry, obviously, on a pretty collaborative process um, in order to come to the point here of the statutory public meeting. <clears throat> um, so really the purpose of today's meeting, it is again statutory under the requirements of the Development Charges Act, specifically section 12. Uh, the purpose here is to provide public with an opportunity to make representation on the proposed 2019 Development Charges Bylaws. The information that we're going to be going through um, specifically in relation to the background study was made publicly available on April 18th of 2019 and the DC bylaws um, were all made publicly available on May 8th. Those requirements are consistent with the requirements of the notice requirements of the Development Charges Act um, and, and obviously sufficient notice of this meeting was also uh, provided in the Toronto Star um, well in advance of this meeting in accordance with the regulations in the Act as well. So just a bit of a background on development charges. The city's DC bylaws are seven of them in total. They expire on August 2nd of 2019. Um, in order for the city to continue collecting development charges, um, new DC bylaws would need to be passed um, in advance of that day. Um, the 2019, the actual background study itself um, is very technical. It includes all the calculation methodologies and assumptions and the rates themselves. Um, the actual DC bylaws, the seven of them, uh, do administer the collection of the development charges bylaws, so obviously um, correlated in a sense, but different in the sense of the background study is the more technical document and the uh, bylaws are obviously a more of a legal document administering those collections and enforcement of those rates. Um, so the key takeaways, obviously, we've had to undertake this study in order for the city to continue collecting DCs and new bylaws have to be passed in advance of the expiry date in August. Uh, just a bit of an overview and just to provide some context here, um, city staff have engaged the Building Industry and Land Development Association build um, for input through their DC study process. Um, we've had several meetings with them, the broader build PO chapter. Um, with that, uh, sub-working committees uh, were formed to discuss a lot of the technical inputs and assumptions which are laid out through the technical uh, background study itself. Um, since the release of it and, and obviously from the outset of the process, there's been ongoing back <coughs> the build. Um, and with those ongoing dialogue, um, since the, the release of the background study, there have been some adjustments to the rate calculations which have taken place, um, and those are reflected in the staff report that you have, as well as the public meeting presentation and the calculated rates that we'll see uh, going forward here. So overall, it's been a very uh, collaborative process, and uh, again, thank the development industry for their cooperation with that. So just to give a bit of an overview in terms of the development forecast and um, some of the summary of it, Overall, we're looking at population increase of about 242,000 people, census population, over the period through to 2041. Um, with that, we're looking at employment increases of about 121,000 employees, and those uh, new of uh, the population will be residing uh, within those household increases of about 76,000 households over that period. Um, and all the population employment and figures here are uh, consistent with the ongoing municipal comprehensive review undertaken with the Peel region and as well as the uh, growth plan outlook and, and, and the our targets that are set there are consistent with that. So we are obviously working within the provincial guidelines and requirements outlined um, by those, uh, those statutory documents. Uh, once we have the actual forecast themselves, um, we have a development related capital program just to give a bit of an overview of um, what those projects are based on. Um, certainly the 2019 capital budget was a key input into this process. Several master plans have been undertaken by the city, um, the transportation master plan, uh, parks and recreation master plan, several business plans, station location studies, library master plans, um, the transit uh, inclusive of the transit business plans as well. Um, obviously there's been a significant consultation with respective departments in understanding what capital project needs are required to service development over the 10 year planning period as well as the longer term planning period to 2041. And those conversations, all those documents have played a key input into the kind of forming of that capital program, that capital budget, which we'll see in, in the following slides. Um, in accordance with the Development Charges Act, once we have a capital program or a capital project, um, there's a series of deductions that have to be made in accordance with the legislation that we have to consider under the DC Act. So any anticipated grant subsidies or contributions which are anticipated, and that could be in the way of uh, 
the public transit uh, funding stream or any other grants and subsidies which we anticipate coming in are used to offset the cost of the program. Any benefit to existing or replacement shares. Um, any available DC reserve funds that are on hand are used to offset the cost of the program. Um, under the Development Charges Act is a statutory requirement for a 10% general service discount. That 10% discount um, can't be funded through DCs and applied to general services such as parks and recreation, library services, that's a, effectively a tax supported contribution for all growth related projects and that has to be made on, uh, in, in consistent with the legislation that has been done. And any shares of the program or project that benefit development beyond the planning period, what we like to call post period benefit, are included in the calculations. Again, doesn't affect the and adjust what actually is funded in your period through development charges. And those are the things that we've looked at on a case by case basis on each of the individual programs and, and projects. So keeping that in mind, just as a summary of the total cost in the 2019 DC study, uh, just to go through the table itself, we have all the service categories from which development charges are included for in, in the preparation of this background study. Um, we have the gross cost column, which are all the total program costs of what's DC eligible, what we consider to have a DC component. Total program is $4.47 billion. And uh, the general services all the way up to transit covers a 10-year period. <coughs> What's important, the roads component goes all the cost all the way through to 2041, consistent with the planning <coughs> process. Uh, one kind of notable item that I guess you can, of that 4.47 billion, um, notably transit is representing <coughs> 1.6 billion of that, and your roads program is representing $1.9 billion of that, and recreation then the, the next largest component at $600 million. So, Certainly over, well over 80% of the costs <coughs> are on the transit, uh, roads, and recreation components of the program. The grants de and developer costs, so any shares of programs that um, are being offset by any incoming funding or developer shares of projects represent just over $1 billion uh, of that, and most of that relates to transit um, in terms of some upper level government funding um, in order to offset the cost of that program. Any shares of projects that uh, benefit to existing or your 10% uh, tax supported contribution amount to about $563 million. Um, any available DC reserve funds, again, that we mentioned, it's about $213 million, which can be applied towards the program, have been used to offset the projects that are occurring first. And any shares of the program that benefit uh, development beyond the planning period represent $285 million. The balance of that component of the of those projects is what we have is the DC recoverable share. And that represents just over about 2.4 million or 2.38 million dollars, a billion dollars. Um, and the majority of that, um, again, relates to your roads component at 1.6 billion dollars, the majority of that, and again, that's cost through 2041. Uh, parks and recreation at 353 million, and your transit services at 308 million dollars. So, very much a transportation related um, DC recoverable component between roads and transit and recreation, the next largest component. So keeping in mind those costs in terms of what's actually being DC recoverable, and that DC recoverable obviously gets directly inputted into the calculation of the rate relative to the new uh, households and new population employment that's coming in to the city. Um, the calculated rates that we have here, the graph itself looks at the distribution of the charges um, for each of the individuals and the, the service categories to what makes up the actual calculation of the rate. And the table on the right is actually the calculated development charges uh, on a per unit basis. So residentially for a single and semi detached unit, um, $37,881 is calculated. The rates are distributed, or I guess, uh, kind of uh, delineated between the different uh, housing types between singles and all the way down to small apartments with rows and large apartments as well. Uh, so the rates go from the 37,881 for a single down to about $13,000, $123 for a small apartment uh, new construction. And with the weighted and the distribution of the total calculated residential DC rate, um, similar to, as I mentioned with the, with the table on the previous slide, um, your roads and related uh, representing about 47% of that total calculated charge um, and your transit charge representing 17% of that total charge. Um, the next largest component being your recreation component at 28% of the total calculated rate. And that, those kind of three pieces of the puzzle really do make up a large uh, portion of that total calculated rate that we're seeing here. And this is on the residential side. So the next question you ask, uh, well, what does that actually uh, mean relative to some of the current rates that are, that are in place in the city? 
Uh, currently, the rate is about $30,941 for a single and semi-detached unit. As I mentioned, the calculated charge is moving to $37,881. So a difference of just less than $7,000 in terms of the total quantum of the charge for a single and semi-detached unit, representing a difference of about 22%. Again, most of the uh, move or I guess shipment, shift in the charge is related to uh, a couple factors. Transit being uh, the largest component of that increase of about 274% or $4,800 of that total and there's been a shift in terms of the uh, Development Charge Act and the amendments in 2016 which allowed a lot more latitude in terms of the way transit development charges can be calculated um, relative to the way they've been calculated in 2014 with, based on the previous background study and that uh, adjustment in the legislation has allowed for a forward-looking service level um, which has uh, resulted in, in a more upward pressure on the transit rate allowing the city to fund more transit um, costs through the growth related costs through development charges. Um, and we see the roads and related component uh, representing again uh, about $1,400 to $1,500 of that uh, $6,900 rate increase. And again, the total quantum increase is 22% on the current uh, rate. Keeping that into the context and to some of the benchmarking exercise, uh, looking at some of the communities here in terms of uh, the GTA municipalities of development charges. Um, and what the current rates are in Brampton relative to the draft calculated rates that we have. Um, I guess there's a few things that I'd like to point out. This graph includes both the upper tier regional DCs, the lower tier the municipal development charges, as well as the school board DCs. Um, we're in a bit of a DC bylaw cycle um, where many development charge bylaws are currently under review and many municipalities are undergoing a similar process to like Brampton in updating a new DC bylaw. So there's a lot of asterisks that you see beside uh, many of the, the cities and, and communities here in terms of development charges that have been calculated and the rates are out in the public, but uh, many of those have not been put, um, passed by council at that point in time. Um, with that said, just looking in, in terms of the calculated for current, um, the rate is total right now about just over close to $91,000 for the city of Brampton, uh, moving to about $97,570 um, in terms of the calculated rates that we have. And, and really the middle of the, of the, of the pack in terms of the, you're comparing municipalities, uh, much less than the likes of uh, the city of Vaughan or uh, King City. Um, I guess just in, as a, another added point, the, the bulk of the rate here is uh, related to some of the regional components of the development charges have water and wastewater services. So when you actually combine both the regional and the, and the lower tier communities, the actual quantum of the rate increase actually what's payable by one building a new house is actually about an 8% increase on the total payable charge relative to 22% because that just reflects the lower tier change that we've calculated here today. And again, uh, just less the, as a, a note to your direct comparing municipality of Mississauga, um, it is still less than the calculated rates that we have um, that are calculated for the city of Mississauga. That's uh, what we have for Brampton as well. So about a $2,000 difference in terms of that. In terms of the non-residential development charges rates, uh, those are, again, calculated on a per square meter basis or per square foot. Uh, the, the rates we have here are the non-residential DC rates per square meter. Um, total charges vary by the type of um, industry, industrial, major office, or non-industrial and non-office. Um, the total charge for industrial is about $59.22 per square meter. Uh, major office is $236.55, and your non-industrial and non-office rate is $117.60. Um, it is a bit of a different rate structure that was currently uh, in place in the city of Brampton, where major office has been segregated out into its own category. Um, and we'll get into some options around the, surrounding major office and the treatment of that on a go-forward basis. So just uh, looking into, again, the keeping those rates in mind in terms of the benchmarking analysis. The current charge in Brampton for an industrial um, is about, total is about $214 per square meter, moves up to about $221 per square meter. So, and after the calculator rates are considered, they're still at the, and the lower end of the spectrum in terms of the total quantum of the development charges for an industrial development um, relative to some of the surrounding municipalities and much less than the likes of those in, in Vaughan, Mark, and King as well and again, uh, less than those in the, in the city of Mississauga directly uh, next to you. <clears throat> and just, uh, I guess, another benchmarking here. Um, the current charge in 
grant in for a major office, which is currently grouped with the industrial operations, um, is lower at about $287. Um, when a uh, major office gets segregated into its own category, um, it does put upward pressure on the rates and, and will put that total rate of about $471 per square meter, um, higher, the highest in, in, in the comparing municipalities in terms of um, the actual development charge that is payable. Um, again, we'll, we, in the following slides or in part of the staff report, there's some recommendations in terms of managing the major office uh, development charge that w that's been calculated through this process. So I've alluded to some of the key factors influencing the rate changes already. Um, again, uh, certainly residentially and non-residentially, the 26th Amendment to the Development Charges Act um, provided for forward-looking service levels. Um, for greater recovery for transit services and certainly with the amount of transit um, uh, capital costs and infrastructures required to service development, um, that has certainly put upward pressure on the transit calculated rates that we have. Um, the unit cost for road projects had increased since 2014, um, which have uh, again uh, put some, some pressure on the roads component of the projects and in general an increased level of service and service levels which have allowed for greater recovery from those general service categories. So just in terms of some of the, that was more of the technical components and uh, the next couple of slides look at some of the policy review that uh, city staff is proposing um, as part of the, the bylaw process. Um, and we'll go through the, each of these uh, briefly and we've already discussed some of these in, in more details in the staff report as well. Um, the discounted hotel DC rate, which is currently in place, um, the proposed change to remove that discount on the whole DC, on the hotel DC rate as um, over the last number of years, it hasn't really been much of an uptake uh, to that. Um, speculative non-residential buildings, um, the proposed change here is to secure a letter of credit on shell building permits if the end use is unknown. So the difference between your, um, your commercial and your industrial rate would be secured until the actual un the known user is known at the end of the period, which kind of prevents revenue loss from the city's end, um, ensuring that they, they, they're collecting the right DC rate. With the, with the right use. Um, any demolition credits, uh, there's a 10 year sunset clause on non-residential development credits and five years on residential is the current proposal. Um, and that's pretty consistent with what we see in municipalities across uh, the GTA, including uh, a sunset clause on those demolition credits. Uh, back to back townhouses, uh, they're currently charged the large apartment rate City staff are proposing to move to charging the townhouse rate, which again uh, is a consistent practice that we see across uh, GTA municipalities and consistent with the occupancy patterns of those townhouses and those and those back-to-back -back townhouses. So uh, it certainly is a technical move um, in terms of the practice of it to be consistent with the study as well as a common practice that we see uh, throughout uh, GTA municipalities as well. Um, again, uh, in terms of a policy issue for major office, recognizing that the calculated rates does put some upward pressure on the major office development charges. Um, there is the potential to phase in or discount uh, to those major offices of at least 50,000 square feet, and uh, they have to be at least two stories. Um, the quantum of the discount is up to council discretion. I know in the staff report there's some mention of uh, phasing them in or making uh, a freeze on your current um, rate that's currently enforced. But um, again, the, that could be subject to a matter of uh, consideration from council to the level of discount uh, provided. Uh, the exemption of secondary units from development charges, um, potential exemption again extended to the creation of a second unit at the onset of construction of the primary unit. Uh, currently, you know, secondary units are exempt under the Development Charges Act if it's created after the fact, but if the secondary unit was created at the time of permit, at the, at the outset of it, they would now be exempt. Um, and, and given the, the, there hasn't really been any secondary suites um, that have paid development charges, they would it really result in zero revenue loss or revenue neutral situation for the city and a good promotion uh, to uh, increase housing supply and affordable housing. And the last point is the change of use exemption to provide some development charge relief on change of use on industrial to non-industrial conversions if it meets the criteria as listed uh, below. Um, and, and, and uh, there's again more details in the staff report that is provided. I did want to end off with a, a bit of a recap here in terms of Bill 108, which you may uh, have heard about, the More Homes and More Choices Act 2019. 
So it was a provincial announcement on the bill on May 2nd of 2019 and effectively proposed changes to the Development Charges Act and the Development Charges Regulation. Um, as part of that and consistent with some of the policies that are actually being brought forward, exempting secondary suites from development charges and new construction is one of those policies and that, and again, that's a, already a policy that's being brought forward uh, by city staff through this process. Um, in addition to that, development charges rates will be payable at different times um, and they would be payable at the, you know, they'd be payable at the time of permit or, but at the rate that's uh, in force at the time of application. So there is a bit of a, of a structure there in terms of when the payment or when the charge would be in place. Um, soft service development charges for libraries, recreation services, for example, are to be, to be collected through a community benefits charges bylaw, which is a bit different, obviously, than the provisions of the current Development Charges Act. I think what's important here, um, it was released on May 2nd, there's a series of regulations that need to be followed with that bill, and those have yet to be released. <coughs> so to the impacts and, this, and associated with the bill at this point in time is still uh, fairly unknown. Um, the, there's comments to the province and they're due uh, June 1st. Um, with that said, there's a statutory requirement here for the city to undertake this process and pass a bylaw, and we're therefore we're kind of continuing on to with that process that's already outlined uh, to continue to go through this process as required. But uh, I, you know, I think it's something that is out there, and we certainly wanted to bring that to the attention. Uh, just to summarize some key dates and next steps here, obviously the purpose today was a statutory public meeting. Um, we will continue consultation with the uh, development industry over the next uh, month or so, um, with the anticipated passage of the development charge bylaws on June 19th, um, and again the the expiry of them is on August 2nd. So. Um, we are looking to pass them um, in advance of that, but the new rates would not come into force, or at least potentially not to come into force um, until the expiry of the existing ones, but certainly passed in June. Uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. We have a few questions. Uh, Councillor uh, Santos first. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation. I support most of the recommendations in here. Um, my question is about the DCs related to, or lack of DCs related to the second units during primary build, and um, the disincentive perhaps that that might create in building higher quality affordable housing through apartments and condos. So what I worry about is that we're gonna continue on this trend of building affordable housing through basement apartments now in a more legalized framework and a safer framework, because we'll know exactly what's there, but I do worry that that's a shortcut for developers and perhaps an incentive for them not to so I'm develop So by condos. the city clerk, we can only ask questions of okay. clarification because it's a statutory meeting. And the council can debate after. The council can debate after. I'll hold my question okay. then. Are there any questions of clarification? Councilor, the question of clarification, you're next on the list. Okay, uh, Councilman Madero's question for clarification. Yes, uh, if we go back to the slide where um, regarding the change of use for uh, invest, change of use exemptions. So just to confirm, when you talk about DC relief, does that mean wave of DCs or a reduction in what the DC charges would be? That would be uh, a waiver of the DCs should the conversion meet uh, the criteria in the proposed DC bylaw. And the criteria um, are, are on the slide. Above. And, and through the chair, when you looked at, um, in terms of the square meters, why, can you just maybe uh, articulate a little bit more of why is that important in terms of the size? Through the chair, just a question of clarification. You're wondering why we picked the threshold yeah, of 1,000 square meters. Okay, thank you for your question. We looked at the past conversions that occurred in the city of Brampton over the last seven to 10 years, and uh, we wanted to be mindful of uh, what units actually received this exemption. Um, we, we understand that some of the older industrial mall type uh, of, of um, spaces, they're not, they're no longer usable to a modern day industrial user. So 
the type of unit that we had in mind for this particular exemption were, was that type of unit, the older industrial mall that has been unitized. And typically those units in those industrial malls are less than 1,000 square meters. Um, we wanted to also be mindful of the larger industrial spaces. We don't necessarily want to, from um, a policy planning perspective, want to convert those larger industrial spaces uh, to commercial uses, and we want to, um, from a policy perspective, retain those as employment land employment. And, and then I guess through uh, Mr. Mayor, and, and again, the, the height of 19 feet. Um, so I, I guess my concern derives from, if you go along Rutherford Road, Rutherford or Renda area, and you have a lot of these old warehouses which used to have industrial uses, and now they're seeking to bring in um, <coughs> I guess I'm not sure if they would be considered, they're not industrial per definition, but it's just, I guess over adva advancements of technology, it's no longer required that machinery. So, um, and, and I guess I just don't want to be caught in, uh, or some of these businesses be caught in, be caught in definitions <coughs> of, um, you know, 19 feet and all of a sudden we find out it's 21 feet. Um, you know, th those types, because right now a lot of them are empty and there seems to be, um, you know, we want to make sure that it makes it easier for them to get people working, get uh, people paying in taxes. So these thresholds are thresholds based on, you told me, 17 years. Um, and in terms of best practices or jurisdictional, other jurisdictions, does this seem to be the thresholds they're using? Uh, through the chair, uh, to my knowledge, uh, <coughs> the city of Brampton would be a leader in this respect in providing yeah. uh, this kind of exemption on change of use. Uh, typically, municipalities, uh, it's an all or nothing uh, type of scenario. Either they charge every uh, the full yeah. development charge rate for a change of use, or they don't charge change of use at all. So we wanted to provide some relief to uh, potential small businesses that wanted to locate in the city of Brampton but we also wanted to be mindful of retaining or preserving uh, prestige employment land um, as such. Okay, but still, there's still an opportunity through Mr. Mayor for uh, if there's concerned businesses, they can still provide comment because uh, this only gets enacted June 19th, right? It would be past June 19th, yeah. correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of clarification? Councilor Fertini? Uh, just highlighting what Council Madero said. Uh, so anything before 1996, and I know that we have a lot of areas like in this area on Clarence and all, a lot of these buildings are empty because change of use is so expensive to change the use. Do we have a chart of how the municipalities use? Because I'm hearing, and I don't know if it's true, how the municipalities really don't charge on, uh, on these type of charges on change of use because they've already paid it once, and then all of a sudden something else comes along and people are saying, too much money, we don't even know, and they're kind of moving out these business, and they, all these buildings are being empty, and we're losing all the taxes out there. Right. Do we have a chart? Are there municipalities a chart? Or not? Uh, through the chair, uh, staff would be happy to provide um, yeah, uh, a comparison table on, on what municipalities do charge uh, change of use and what municipalities uh, don't charge that. Yeah. Because I know Mississauga, as far as I know, I think they don't charge, I'm not sure, that's what I'm hearing. So a lot of them from here, you're just going over to that side. So you know, you're saving tons of money at the beginning already. And these buildings are being empty here. And you know, at the 19 feet, usually all new buildings are <coughs> four, four feet. So we kind of cap at 19 feet, three feet below the new buildings. Uh, should be at 24 feet. Is all. Okay. Those are standard. Right. Right? Okay. Any questions for clarification? Um, having said that, uh, Councilor Plessy wants to move the... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to bring uh, the reports forward. Is it 7-1 and 9-1? Or 7-1 <coughs> for us, and I'm bringing forward 9-1. For you, Mr. Chair, 9-1 is the staff report. 7-1 uh, is the statutory public meeting item, which we're on right now, and 7.4 <coughs> is the related presentation that Hampson Consulting has just delivered. Okay. So uh, I'd like to... I'll bring forward and move um, the three. Which one uh, decides when when staff are coming back to 
Council with uh, recommendations. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe it is item 9.1 and it speaks to um, staff receiving public input at today's statutory public meeting and reporting back and in the body of that report it speaks to the target date of June 19th, I believe it is. Okay, so can I just confirm that um, we, we've only received, I'm, I'm sure you guys did a great job in, in getting out to the public and, and stakeholders. <clears throat> Usually we have a stack of, of correspondence at this point for, uh, um, for the, a review like this especially DCs. We only have two, um, and so some of the questions uh, in here with um, regards to the, um, uh, the increases, um, I think Council is interested in, in the rationale behind some of those increases as well, so when you report back, if we can just um, have that. And then additionally, um, the province and if we go ahead and, and, and move with the, with the new uh, DC bylaw um, and then the province changes kind of the, the rules halfway through the game, um, where are we? So is there an opportunity we can move it closer to the August 2nd? I know that there is the deadline, but is there an opportunity, um, even if we move the report today, can we still have staff come back uh, maybe closer to the August 2nd deadline? Do I have to put that into uh, as an amendment of the uh, of the motion of the staff report? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, if that's the will of council, is to have staff report back after receiving all comments. Um, the the next available council meeting is the 10th of July 10th council meeting, and then there is no other council meeting scheduled until after August 2nd at this current time. Okay, so at the last. And I don't want to limit limit staff. If we have, if we know where the province is going by the June nineteenth date, I believe, which is nineteen days after the end of common, so probably not. But if we do, then come back June nineteenth. If not, then I'd like to move that um, you come back uh, July tenth. Did you say July tenth? Through you, Mr. Chair, July 10th is a tentative council meeting at the moment. Ju June 19th is the last regularly scheduled meeting before the expiration of the development charges bylaws. So perhaps I think staff have heard and, and staff will be reporting back at the appropriate time, certainly before August 2nd. And if it's June 19th, knowing more information, or if it's July 10th, then staff will do that. Or it, it may necessitate a special meeting of council should the need arise. I think this is a this is a pretty important bylaw for the city of Brampton, and and you know we only get to review every four or five years, five years. Um, I think it's important for us to be able to one listen to what the community says, listen to what uh, the province says, um, to ensure that this isn't any kind of in hindrance. So, if uh, if I can move that. Peter, or, or as you stated, staff have heard loud and clear. Through the chair, staff have heard loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, so I have a, the clerk, we have, we have to um, receive the um, presentation. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, and then after that we should uh, open the floor up for any okay. public delegations. Okay. So we'll start off by a motion moved by Councilor Presente, second by Councilor Pelache. Uh, to um, receive the presentation for Hempson Consulting. Um, and then we afterwards accept uh, any delegations. Okay, so all those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, and in terms of delegations, uh, we will proceed with public delegations before Council's consideration of this matter. Please note the public notice regarding the city's new development charges bylaws was advertised on the city's website and social media as well as published on in the Brampton Guardian and the Toronto Star on April 26, 2019. If persons here today wish to speak to Council about this matter, I ask you please come forward since this is the designated time at this meeting to hear your comments and input. For all public delegations today, you will each be given five minutes to speak. This is to ensure everyone who wants to speak will get a chance to address Council. Members may have questions of clarification for you after the delegation. When you come forward, please state your name for the public meeting record. If anyone that would like to come forward. It's 
seen uh, none. We also have correspondence um, from Jennifer Jerzyk, Planner, Policy, and Government Relations, Building, Industry, and Land Development Association and Build, and Joseph Simer, Senior Manager, Development Manager for Smart Centers. So I have a motion from Councillor Vicente and Councillor Paleshi to receive the correspondence. All those in favor? Motion carries. <coughs> Council will now have staff report 9.1 before us, 2019 Development <coughs> Charges Study Public Meeting. Do any members have questions regarding the staff report? Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if we are going to be um, exempting, and this would be a question to staff, if we're going to be exempting s new build secondary units from DCs, obviously that's going to incense both builders and uh, purchasers to build them. Um, what is our thinking with regards to the parking requirements for those single family residences? Through you, uh, Mayor Brown, will let, have staff uh, ad address that in the, the staff report that will be coming back in terms of what the implication is on parking. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. So when we approve a single family residence and uh, the city allocates two, three, four parking spots, uh, the number of parking uh, spots, is, is that consideration for the overall DC charge for that property? Uh, through the chair, um, the development charges, uh, the rates that we set and collect for, um, they, only, they only collect for the, the, the suite of services that was presented today. Uh, parking in terms of uh, on-street parking or uh, that would, would be for the residents is, is not necessarily one of the services <coughs> that uh, the development charges bylaw collects for. Um, we do collect for uh, roads purposes, uh, but um, what I believe you're referring to is uh, parking on local roads, uh, which is uh, a service that is delivered by uh, the developers when they build the subdivision. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, Actually, my concern is not about uh, the street parking because typically we don't allow nighttime street parking. So that kind of makes um, the need for on-property parking absolutely essential. So if, if we're considering having the secondary units, I think we all support that. But what consideration or thinking is there behind the parking allowance? Should we have none? Should we ensure that the driveways are sized appropriately to accommodate the idea that there are two separate units at that home? Um, and what is, how do we consider the impacts that that will have both on the appearance of the neighborhood? Because we can all tell you that the most clear visible sign that we have any legal second units in an area or that there are a number of illegal second units is the manner in which residents are forced to fit the number of vehicles that they have either on uh, the available parking that they have or on their lawns, and we've dealt with that in the past, but on the streets and the kind of shenanigans that go on at night, uh, you know, as residents literally struggle to be able to fully utilize that home. Is there any thinking on our part on how we might deal with that? Through you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Speaking to the requirement, the requirement for parking for a secondary unit would still be reviewed any time a building permit comes in, whether it's from the builder or from an owner trying to create a secondary unit or legalize an existing secondary unit. Um, we do require one additional parking space. So every dwelling in the city of Brampton requires two. If a builder came forward with a model home that had that included a secondary unit in the basement, there must be a requirement that one additional parking space fit on that same property within the maximum driveway width that would be permitted on that land. So 
if a townhouse came in and a builder you know, wanted to put a basement apartment in that and there was insufficient parking, they simply wouldn't be able to construct it. So there wouldn't be an exemption from DCs. I know that the DC exemption, a lot of builders are interested in creating a secondary unit and certainly a lot of owners are interested in having the builder build it, um, but it was still reviewed as always for compliance with the two unit dwelling requirements of the zoning bylaw and that mandates also the path of travel to the entrance as well as the requirement for the additional parking space. Um, do we as a municipality provide a hard number per property on how many cars can be parked on that property? So do we define, I know we define parking spot by size, but have we ever thought of saying at 21 Main Street, you're only allowed to have three vehicles? And that is a hard number that the resident needs to live within. That is not currently how the, the bylaw is worded. No, there is no maximum number. There is a maximum width of a permitted driveway, and however many vehicles you can fit on that permitted driveway is what you'd be able to park there. If you've got a long driveway with no sidewalk, you may be able to fit additional vehicles, but there's no limit, much like you can't prescribe a total number of people that can occupy the house. You can't prescribe a total number of vehicles. It's, it's seen to be people zoning, and. I mean, it, it's possible that we could put that in there, but currently it is not how the bylaws regulate. No. Thank you, Three Chair. I like that you said that it's possible because I think that that should be a primary consideration, given that you have a certain area and it's designed by a certain dimension. Therefore, you would conclude on this property you can fit three cars, four cars, and then that's it. And I think that would be very helpful to our bylaw because when they are driving by, and they're trying to assess whether there is an infraction, that might be a useful guideline for them when trying to assess whether or not to levy a fine. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, another question I have. Uh, in other municipalities, in addition to DCs, which are, of course, I think the lifeblood for many municipalities across Ontario, um, they have the ability to levy other charges. They have additional revenue tools, and given that these uh, potential changes could have a negative impact on the city of Brampton. Are we looking at different ways in which we, like other municipalities, for example, Toronto, which has an amazing opportunity at the transactional level when there is a purchase, of, a purchase and sale of a home, they are able to levy uh, a fee on that transaction and that is very helpful to their, to balancing their budgets and to helping them to maintain their services. Are we thinking along those lines? Have, do we have an opportunity to uh, seek that from the province? <laughs> uh, through the chair. Uh, so um, those are specific uh, rules set in place for the city of Toronto. Um, other municipalities in Ontario do not have that ability to uh, those other other revenue tools, such as um, those transactionals on the sale of, of homes to collect that type of revenue at this point. Um, I know through AMO, uh, Lumco um, municipalities have been advocating for additional revenue tools, such as those, um, but at this point, we don't have those. For you, Mr. Chair, has there been any indication or response in the past from the province on whether or not that would be possible for municipalities like ours? Uh, through the chair, uh, through the uh, advocacy that we've done thus far, um, the answer has been no um, to, to other municipalities. Well, it's uh, pretty unfair that Toronto has an, uh, that amazing ability and other municipalities do not. So I think that that should be continued focus for us. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Santos. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just following up on some of the comments uh, I made earlier about the secondary units, I totally support that you know, we're doing this and that we're now uh, incentivizing legalized secondary units and, and being able to track it for a lot of the reasons that Councillor Vicente mentioned and the school board and everything else. My bigger concern is the whole idea of um, building affordable housing through secondary units as a shortcut uh, for developers to avoid development charges. Um, and I think it would be great to 
for staff to, when they come back and report back to look at some of those other incentives that will protect and incentivize condo development, large, small apartment units based on what you have here, and maybe creatively look at how we can incentivize condos and apartment buildings and more density around transit hubs, um, whether that's through uh, the parking issue and not requiring parking for higher dense um, builds um, as part of a discount for a DC or whatever that is. Because the reality is, is there isn't that much greenfield left in Brampton. And in those areas where there is greenfield, it's farther away from transit, which means they will require a car to commute. Um, so if there is a way for us to balance uh, those incentives to keep density and get developers to intensify close to transit hubs so that we could lessen the reliance on our vehicles, that would be fantastic as part of the report back. Uh, Councillor Fertini. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Uh, just a couple questions on the basement apartment second unit. So in the past, we've been having a hard time registering them because we're making it so difficult. Now we're going to add development charges. They're going to make it even more difficult for them uh, uh, to register. You know, I, I, I feel for the people, a young couple to buy a home or seniors that rent a basement to make the extra income. And now we're adding more on them. And that's why I think we're getting all these uh, apartments without uh, permits because it becomes too expensive by the time we register. Now, if someone is buying it, is, uh, is making money as an income is one thing, but to charge development charges with secondary basements and even on the parking, there's hundreds of places in Toronto. You rent the uh, apartments, there's no parking, no smoking, no pets. And here we force some people, no, you need a parking spot. So this is how we're getting this abuse, people doing the basement apartments and so the, the, I think we're going to look into the D.C. charges on the basement apartments if we're going to make it more affordable for people to register. Okay. Yes, you'd like to respond? Yeah, through the chair. Uh, just one point of uh, clarification uh, to Councillor Fortini. Uh, the development charges would only be payable for the primary unit. So if uh, someone wanted to add a second unit in a basement uh, of a single detached home, development charges would only be charged on that single detached home and our proposed policy would be exempting development charges on that basement apartment. So there would be no charge for development charge on the city's portion uh, for development charges. It's being built on the square footage. So if I take my house down, I got a thousand square feet and I'm building 2,000. I wouldn't pay the difference because it was paid. So now you're charging on development charges in the square footage, you know, because it's an apartment. It's not, it was already paid. Right. Uh, through the chair, just uh, one more point of clarification. Um, so with respect to if um, you were to demolish an existing single detached home, um, all the residential charges are charged by unit type, regardless of the size of the unit. So if you were to demolish a thousand square foot single detached home and then you were to put up a new 2,000 foot single detached home and have a basement apartment, you would get the demolition credit of the existing single detached home and the secondary unit would also be exempt from DC. So there would be no city DCs payable uh, under that scenario. Uh, I'm just trying to get more people registering their basements. And this is where the problem is they don't want to register. It's already costing permits, all this, all this type of money. When they say I got to spend 40,000, I'm renting my basement to help pay my mortgage. And now we're going to add more. We just, last year probably had 100, this year we'll have none. So we got to try to make it more easier because if we do make it easier, then the permit comes in. When the permit comes in, impact reassess your property. It goes up, they're getting more property tax. So we're losing. We got over 30,000 basements I hear. So we got to be a little bit flexible. Okay. Uh, Councillor Singh? Yeah, just uh, picking up on the theme of uh, parking, I know we're deviating a little bit, but uh, I think we also have a report coming, right? Uh, could we have a delegation on the uh, compulsory parking permits as a cost recovery property tax reduction mechanism? 
Uh, I remember um, yeah, Mr. DeGroote had done that uh, delegation. And in that report, we're supposed to look at options for parking and for secondary units in particular, looking at a paid parking option. So maybe that'll uh, change the dynamics of this conversation coming forward because that could really change things um, for us moving forward. So that's coming down the pipeline, I think. Okay. Councilor Bowman. Thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just very quickly, uh, Councilor Fortini almost got to the question I was going to ask, but he stopped short, so I hope it's a continuation of where he was going. Uh, does MPAC currently have a classification for a single-family dwelling with a professionally built-in at-build second unit? Through the chair, Councillor Bowman, no, they don't. It's just a single family detached, regardless of whether there's a secondary unit. Okay, is, is there an opportunity, since this is now changing, um, that, that we can go to the province or go to MPACT and ask them to create a, a classification? Because it's basically, it becomes an apartment. Yeah, through the chair, it would have to be through the province, not MPACT. So there's an option for us to, to we could go advocate. through the province to have that change. We could advocate. Because either way, I think, I think Councillor Fortini was getting to the same thing, that um, if someone has an income-generating apartment, um, it's, it's different than a single-family dwelling as far as, as far as the city should be concerned and as far as impact should be concerned. Different, correct, but under the legislation, the same currently. Okay. Always the possibility, though, of opening it up. Always. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Fertini again. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just forgot one question. So, we're looking at the BC basement apartments. How come, what about all these Airbnbs we have in the city of Brown, Texas? We don't look at their development charges. But through the so chair, uh, through the chair um, the Airbnbs typically, um, they would take the form of uh, typical residential unit. And um, at the creation of the Airbnb, whether that be uh, an apartment unit or a townhouse or single-family detached dwelling, uh, they would be they would be charged uh, the full development charge at the time uh, the permit is, is issued. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no more uh, questions. Um, There's no more questions, so I have a motion from Councillor uh, Pileschi, seconded by Councillor Vicente, to uh, approve the report recommendations. All those in favor? Sure. Just a clarification. A little clarification before the vote. Councillor Medeiros. M my apologies. Just regarding the downtown development. Uh, regarding downtown development, so, would, would there going to be any impact in terms of changes to the DCs? Through the chair, uh, would you be referring to the community improvement program that's already in place and in the, in the incentive program that's in place? So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, do we, for example, the incentive of waiving DCs for downtown development. Uh, through the chair, the, the, the only incentive program I'm aware of currently that uh, the city offers with respect to the waiving of development charges is through uh, the CIP, and there is a development charges incentive program um, that has been um, gaining some traction. Uh, most recently, in January of this year, uh, there was a condo unit at 45 Railroad Street that did take advantage of the development charges incentive program. And uh, I think upwards to uh, most of the city's development charges were waived as part of this program. So as part of this program, this program is geographical or based on what the, is it, so it's based on the downtown community. Yeah, through the it, chair. It, it, so there's no changes to that. No changes, through the chair, no changes to that. So the geographic uh, boundaries of the DCIP roughly runs uh, along the Queen Street corridor, so a major transit corridor 
uh, from roughly McLaughlin to east of the uh, Highway 410. Thank you. So we have two motions. Uh, the first is to receive the presentation. Oh, Councilor Martini. Is that a new building? So someone's building a high rise or something. They don't charge development charges in that area. It still stays by 45%. I'm talking about new construction. Someone's building a 10 story building. We have an area where you, they don't pay development charges. So could, to attract these businesses. To, through the chair, that's correct. That that is that is the point and of the incentive program. Have we ever looked into extending it past the 410, going all along Queen Street? Uh, through the chair, I, I would have to defer to my colleagues in planning to see if they are opening up the the okay. current thank you. Program. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we have two motions here. The first is to receive the presentation from Andrew Marabella, Hampson Consulting Limited. Moved by Councillor Pelleschi, seconded by Councillor Vicente. All those in favor? Motion carries. And the second motion is the report from J. Lee Manager Capital Development Finance Corporate Services dated May 16, 2019 to the Council Media May 22nd uh, Development Charges Study Public Meeting be received and the staff be directed to report back to Council regarding the results of the public meeting and the appropriate development changes, charges, recommendations. That was moved by Pelleschi and Councillor Dillon. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Our next item is Delegation 7.2 regarding the proposed amendments to the business licensing and user fee bylaws driveway widenings. At the May 13th Planning and Development Committee meeting, the committee recommended proceeding with a number of staff recommendations pertaining to regulating driveway widenings. Including in the committee recommendations were proposed amendments to the city's licensing bylaw and user fee bylaw. Before changes can be made to these bylaws, public notice is required for these proposed amendments. We also have a related staff report, item 9.2, regarding the transmittal of implementing bylaws driveway widenings review. We'll consider the staff report after receiving any delegations on this matter. Is there anyone here today who wishes to come forward and speak to council regarding the proposed changes to the city's licensing bylaw and user fee bylaw in regard to driveway widenings? Seeing none, I have a motion by uh, Councillor uh, Pelleschi, seconded by Councillor Vicente, to receive the delegations today regarding proposed amendments to these bylaws. There's no delegation, so that's not necessary. We'll now consider staff report item 9.2 regarding the transmittal of implementing bylaws driveways. Do any members have questions or comments on the staff report? Councillor Fertini? Thank you. Just to staff. Uh, I just want to thank them for all the hard work they, they've done on this. I know it's been a long battle since December. Um, just, I'm just worried about what are we going to do with driveways. <laughs> I don't think we can grandfather some driveways in. Uh, and, uh, look at things that, because really, I know we're going to be asking for permits and we're the contract to responsible. I'm just worried about someone for having a driveway an extra foot or two, and we're going to be cutting this driveway. If we could uh, look at these certain driveways and say, uh, I think Elizabeth's got, oh, there she is. If they have at least, you know, 40% or 45% of green space in front, maybe we can let them slide a bit. I don't and that two foot section on one side, you know, if we can bring it down, if they're off a foot, just leave it. Because it's, unless it's actual, it's easy to cut. <laughs> Uh, like I, I really feel bad for some of them. I went around it. It's just more just for a foot and a half to two feet. We, we have to cut these driveways on one side. So now if we get the whole driveway right across the whole lot, I, I agree with it. I don't want a parking lot, but you know, see maybe how we can help some of the residents. Because some of them, you look at them, they're gorgeous and they've been out there. It's, just, it's a shame. Yeah. I don't know. Through you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> to Councillor Fortini, I can assure you that where we are able to grandfather or declare a driveway to be legal non-conforming, um, which is really what we're basing the use of the 2007 air photo, being that the bylaw that amended the old provisions was introduced in the fall of 2006. So anything that was constructed or is already evident on the 2007 air photo that we have, which is a lovely clear air photo, is deemed to be legal non-complying. So we do not require any 
modification to those driveways to bring it into compliance with the standards that are in place today. If it has been widened since 2007, then we are obligated to enforce the bylaw as it was in place at the time the modification was made. Um, certainly understanding that that two feet of permeable is, is a difficulty for some. Um, I can confirm, however, though, that many driveways, especially on the smaller lots, if you've got a 30-foot lot, you get a 22-foot wide driveway. So that's already upwards of 70% of your front yard as driveway. So to simply exempt people who are at 40%, well, they likely comply with the bylaw in any event. Um, I understand that the issue, though, is that two feet of permeable. So if it were at council's will that we no longer enforce that or direction to enforcement staff um, to be as flexible as possible in enforcing that, that's certainly some direction that staff would be willing to take. And I, and I, I know you guys did a lot of work, and I really think I'm talking more uh, when I'm looking at 40% on 50-foot lots. Of course, if it's 20 feet, you, you don't expect it to have a single driveway. That two feet is really bothering me because one side we're allowed to put benches or light poles on that side for one foot we cut. Now, if you have the two garages on both facing each other, I get it, you need that you're two feet. But if they're on the opposite side and you've got grass on your neighbor, it makes no difference if it's six inches this way or six inches that. The water's still going to run in the grass at the end. So that's what I'm trying to say because that's where mostly our, our drivers are being cut, that one foot right there. So some people are leaving one feet instead of two. That's, that's really, I feel bad for them. Yeah, and I appreciate that. It's certainly something that if we were to modify it, it would either have to be a direction of council or a modification and amendment to the zoning bylaw, which does require a minimum of two feet on that side adjacent to the property line. So can't we look at, if my neighbor, if I do my driveway, like if you come, my house is on like a pie shape. So in the front, I don't have, let's say two feet. When I do in the back, I got three feet. My neighbor doesn't complain. Why do we have to let them complain a guy across the street? Because we had an argument after we've been living there 10 years. And then he says, well, he doesn't have two feet. So I think we, we got to look at the neighbor, what the neighbor says. If you do your, my, your driveway, you didn't ask me, then you say, hey, you know what? I need the water going there. And, and I get it. But if the neighbor doesn't complain, why are we touching that one foot? I, I understand the the you know, the issue that has been resulting. I, I can confirm that pie shaped lots are actually treated differently, where lot lines converge towards the front. There is some flexibility in the bylaw to reduce that two feet of permeable. It doesn't have to be a pie shaped driveway to correspond with the lot lines. Um, uh, where a driveway has not existed prior to the change in the bylaw, staff are simply obligated to enforce it as it's currently. <laughs> Again, though, with council direction, if there is, is something that you would like us specifically to review, and certainly our the comprehensive bylaw that's currently underway, that review is looking very closely at driveway width requirements and permissions and walkways, and we might go back to you know different color surfaces being a walkway rather than driveway, and then um, find some ability to ticket those who actually park on their walkway. At this point in time, we don't have that ability. Um, we're simply enforcing it as a maximum hard and level surface that's capable of being parked upon and requiring that two feet because it's prescribed in the bylaw. Um, yeah, and, and, and maybe we could also look at some of the lots are wide in the front. I know one resident, he feels so bad now because he's got 78 foot frontage, but the back is 32 or 33. And when he went and said, look, oh, you're allowed 30 feet. He only did 27 feet. He didn't know that you measure in 15 meters in and you take the average lot. Now he's three feet over size. And he, meanwhile, he was allowed to do 30 when they looked at the frontage. So now he's got all that nice concrete there. And they said, well, which we put benches on there. But some other people don't know that. So that's where. where no, I, I appreciate that. And, and as we have discussed on that issue through the chair, we. Uh, Lot width is dictated as a measurement in the bylaw, where lot lines converge towards the rear. Lot width is taken 15 meters back, where they converge towards the front. You're at a six meter back um, measurement. So there are some flexible rules in that regard. It's not simply your street frontage, which is the front lot line that abuts the street. Okay, I appreciate it. So since we, a lot of times we talked about the water on the, can we look also in the backyards? Why we're only allowing one foot in the back, you should have the same in the back, like have at least 50% of the grass. So all that water doesn't go in there. Our drains, if we always talk about water. That's, most of that water is always slopes to the back. It was in the swales, it was in the drain, and it comes in the front. 
So really, we're worried about one foot in the, back, in the front, but we're not worried about 30 feet of concrete in someone's backyard because they don't want to cut the grass. Okay. Okay, through the chair, I can confirm yeah. that that is on the agenda for the comprehensive review, and we are studying it right now. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fertini. So um, that takes us to, there's no other uh, questions. Um, all those, um, I have a motion moved um, by Councillor Willens and Councillor Bowman. Um, and this, that the report from B. Steger, Manager of Development Services, be received. The bylaw 105 2019 be passed to adopt the driveway permit bylaw. The bylaw 106 2019 be passed to amend the business licensing bylaw. And the bylaw 107 2019 be passed to amend the user fee bylaw. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, I added the discussion 17.3 to today's agenda to discuss the matter in regard to street naming and cultural recognition. Uh, if I could put the motion uh, on the, actually, um, no, sorry, before we get there, um, do we have Navdeep Gill uh, here today? I know Navdeep was here last week, and so I don't think they're going to be here today, but their request actually flows into 17.3. Um, Okay. Well, I think the original notion of, of bringing it up was because if they were here, but if they're not here, we can deal with it in the regular order. Yeah. So you have a question, Councilor Fertini? So the, the delegation that was here, I think they've had a scheduling a mix up there. They, they were waiting last week, and that was in regards to the group that uh, wanted to name a street after Ride for Raja, which is that annual event uh, uh, for that fallen Brampton uh, resident that I, I know Councillor Singh and Councillor Dillon know quite well. So um, we know what their request was and we can deal with it when we, when we get to 17.3. 7.4, this item was considered as part of delegation. Um, uh, item 7.1. Uh, 9.1, this item was considered as part of uh, item 7.1. 9.2, this item was considered as part of delegation item 7.2. That brings us to 9.3. Our next item is staff report 9.3, park naming to commemorate Philippines national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal. The referred motion is listed in the Committee of Council Minutes as recommendation CW221-2019. This item was referred to staff to report today, today's council meeting in response to the delegation at Committee of Council last week to name a city park after the Filipino hero, Dr. Jose Rizal. The re report was distributed to council at the start of today's meeting. There was five parks recognized with a recommended uh, park. So uh, do any members have questions regarding to the staff report? No questions. I, I just want to say thank you to staff for working um, so quickly on this and identifying some great options. Um, this, the, and maybe actually just to Bruce, if you could identify the recommended park so those in the audience today who had pushed this can know what the identified site was. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it, uh, the, the site is at the intersection of George Gray Drive and Sarno Road, which is just uh, east of uh, East of Dixie and south of uh, Mayfield Road in, uh, in a new uh, subdivision that's being developed there. Um, just maybe for Council's information, as, as these new ones are coming on, you'll see in the report some references to names, but those names are usually just administrative, simply so that we can refer to them more easily as opposed to Park Block 172, which is kind of meaningless to everyone. So. Um, so there were, as indicated in the report, five this year. And, and we uh, tried to select uh, our recommendation to you was the one which we felt was uh, sort of of more significance and more central to the city, although um, certainly any of them could be chosen. And so it, it shows why this was a great idea. You have a name that had no significance to the community, and now we're picking a name that's got significance an emotional attachment to the community. 
So thank you to Councillor Santos who really uh, advocated for this. I think it's uh, it'll be beautiful when we can see that uh, unveiled. Um, I would note that the, we got some major events coming up with the Philippine Independence Day celebration at City Hall and flag raising. We also have uh, the Hallow Hallow party. So it'll be great that we can announce this uh, um, at those events. Uh, uh, so thank you to members of the community that worked hard on uh, raising this to the city's uh, attention. So we have a motion. Um, a move by Councillor Pileschi, seconded by Councillor Santos. The report from M1, Director of Environment and Development Engineering, dated May 21st, 2019, to the Council meeting of May 22nd, 2019, in regards to park naming to commemorate the Philippines national hero, Dr. Joseph Rizal, be received, and the staff be directed to assign the commemorative name, Dr. Jose Rizal Park, to the future park at the Block 162, located at the intersection of George Gray Drive and Sarno Road. All those in favor? Motion carries. So that park will be dedicated this year. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 9.4, this item was considered as part of the consent motion. 9.5, this was part of the consent motion. 9.6 was also part of the consent motion. 9.7 was part of the consent motion. Um, number 11, we're now at committee reports or minutes, we have three committee reports in the forms of minutes on today's agenda. Under council's meeting procedures, the committee or section chair introduces their committee report or minutes and summarizes the matters considered and now brought forward to council today for ratification. Councillor Fertini, you chair the Citizen Appointments Committee, which met on April 3rd, 9th, 12th, 23rd, and 26th, and May 13th. There are three sets of committee minutes are here today for council approval. I'll now pass the chair to you to lead council in consideration of the committee minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, member of council, you got the minutes in front of you of the Citizen Appointment Committee. Any questions? Councillor Dillon. Um, if there's um, further questions we have in regards to, okay. we're going to look at it in camera. Yeah. Okay. These were other committees. Yeah, touch. Okay. Thank you. Pass it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. See no further questions. Uh, thank you. I have a motion from Councillor Bertini, seconded by Councillor Vicente. The minutes of the Citizen Appointments Committee me meetings of April 3rd, April 9th, 12th, 23rd, 26th, and May 13th be received and the recommendations outlined in the subject minutes adopted. All those in favor? Motion carries. Council Medeiros, you chaired the Planning Development Committee which met on May 13th. The committee minutes are here for council approval. I now pass the chair to you to lead council in consideration of the committee minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of council, you have before you the minutes of uh, the Planning and Development Committee of May 13th. Are there any questions or comments? Back to you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Councilor Medeiros. I have a motion by Councilor Medeiros, seconded by Councilor Vicente. The minutes of the Planning Development Committee meeting of May 13th to the Council meeting of May 22nd be received and the recommendations outlined in the subject minutes approved. All those in favor? Motion carries. Committee of Council met on May 15th. The committee recommendations are only are here for council approval. The minutes will be presented to the June 5th City Council meeting for receipt. Councilor Dillon chaired the entire meeting, including all its sections. I will now pass the chair to Councilor Dillon to lead council in the consideration of the committee recommendations. Council will then consider a motion to approve the recommendations in its entirety after all summaries and any resulting council questions or debate has finished. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, are there any questions? Seeing none, pass it back to you. Okay, I'll, uh, this is a motion moved by Councillor Dillon, seconded by Councillor Santos. The summary recommendations from the Committee of Council meeting be received and the recommendations approved. All those in favor? Motion carries. Correspondence, this item was considered as part of the consent motion. That takes us all the way down to 17.1. Referred matters list. This list is published quarterly on a meeting agenda and a copy is linked with each agenda to include a current listing of matters referred to city staff for further review and or report back to council or committee. Do any members have questions on the referred matters list? Seeing no questions, I have a motion from Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Bowen to 
receive the referred matters list. All those in favor? Motion carries. That brings us to uh, 17.2. Uh, and I'll put this motion on uh, the screen. Uh, I've uh, been in conversations with our chief of police about concerns we've had with uh, public safety in the downtown. Uh, and uh, they're working on looking at having a detachment in our downtown, but I thought a council motion to amplify that request uh, would be appreciated. This is seconded by Councillor Santos um, and Medeiros. And um, uh, I would appreciate council's uh, support of this. I want to send a clear direction to uh, the Peel Police as they plan their next year's budget. This is something important. Uh, I want to make sure residents have a peace of mind in our downtown and a detachment uh, uh, would help with that. Um, and the, the interim chief has been very supportive so far. Any uh, questions, Councillor Santos? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you very much for bringing this forward. Both Councillor Medeiros and I sit on the board of the downtown BIA, and certainly safety has been an ongoing concern that at various board meetings um, they've been bringing up. And I think having uh, police presence more visible in the downtown is certainly going to help alleviate some of those concerns in addition to some of the other things that are happening in the downtown core as well. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. Obviously, as a seconder of the motion, I support it. Uh, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to echo uh, comments of my colleagues. Um, I know uh, this has been a long uh, going issue since I've been elected uh, in 2014 regarding our downtown, and I know um, there seems to be have heightened fears and seem to have impact the businesses. So I think the timeliness of this is, is uh, excellent and uh, um, I think it's important that uh, uh, we do uh, send a signal not only to um, our residents but especially to the downtown uh, businesses who uh, uh, face unique challenges and this is one of the, the largest challenges that we've heard about. So thank you very much for all the due diligence on this. Uh, Councillor Dillon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I appreciate um, you and Councillor Santos bringing this forward. Um, I was just wondering if we can add something into this, particularly the East End. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, a lot of the concerns that residents in Ward 8, 9, and 10 have. And previously, there was a um, it was a neighborhood detachment, a community uh, office. I believe they have one in, um, sorry, Cassie Campbell. What is it called? Sorry if I can just ask. It's called a neighborhood. Um, yeah, and so we used to have one in uh, the Mountain Ash Plaza. For some reason, uh, it was taken away. And so uh, one of the concerns that, again, uh, residents in the East End have is that there's no police presence there. Um, so there's not enough patrolling and not enough, uh, the res response time is just very low. Um, so I'm wondering, in this motion, could it, uh, could we request um, that we look into, uh, additionally, we look into the possibility of having a community uh, detachment um, in the East End as well? So, so far the conversation with uh, the chief have been about a downtown detachment where they previously had one. I know Councillor Pelleschi just asked about having a, uh, a, a detachment in uh, the Mount Pleasant area as well. I'd say given the fact that conversation and the tension has been on this, I would suggest that we keep this motion about the downtown. I would welcome additional motions once we've had the conversation with, with, with the Peel Police. I just think given the fact the conversation has been centered around this, um, I wouldn't want to uh, confuse this request with additional ones. Not saying we can't make additional requests, but um, for the time being, uh, I, would, I would suggest we meet with the chief, get get an explanation on the East End uh, right. hub that, what, that, that was there before and isn't now, I, I'm being told. And then if this explanation isn't satisfactory, then we put a, a, a similar request right. forward. 
So what we can do is, Councillor Singh and I, because this is a discussion we were planning to have, and I'm really glad you brought this up. Brought this up. So we'll uh, commence a discussion with the chief in regards to that. We'll keep you and the rest of council updated, and at a future date, uh, after that discussion, yeah. we'll hopefully we can bring that to, to yeah. the council. Okay, and uh, thank you for understanding. And just out of fairness, we've already had one meeting on the downtown history, and that's why, why and, and I think that's an appropriate conversation to have in the East End as well. Um, Councillor Pileshi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I, I agree with the comments made by Councillor Dillon, and I think the bigger picture here is the fact that, you know, the city of Brampton feels like they're being underrepresented um, by Peel Regional Police. You know, Loafers Lake, we lost our, our uh, policing community center there as well. <clears throat> Cassie Campbell did get one. I, I fully support having one in the downtown. I think that's a, that's a good start. But, you know, when you go down in Mississauga, I think they have a lot more uh, centers and um, opportunities than Brampton has had. So I think this is a, there's a bigger picture that we need to be looking at here. We need to be talking to the region to ensure that we get those, the police presence in those areas. And you know uh, more than we about you know, what's happening in your area and vice versa. Um, so I think that uh, the, the, uh, the bigger conversation with the police on a go forward basis is that presence in our areas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Plush. Yeah, I think it speaks to the, the concern we all had around the table when Mississauga was talking about dissolution, but keeping the police headquarters for Peel Region of Mississauga, uh, and they, you know, couldn't believe that we wouldn't support that. And, and it just, we already have sensitivity that we don't have the um, presence that we want. And uh, uh, I think when we raise issues like this, we're making it abundantly clear to the chief of police and his leadership team. And I sit on the police services board of what we expect. So. Um, I'm glad we're starting that conversation. Uh, all those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, the uh, next item uh, is uh, street naming and cultural recognition. If we could, this is a motion moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Dillon. If we could put this on the screen. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, Councillor Dillon uh, and myself had a meeting with city staff realizing we were getting uh, requests, but there was not really a process to these requests. And whether it's Ride for Raja, whether it's the Filipino um, Park for Dr. Joseph Rozell, there wasn't a structure behind it. And so working with the city clerk, he put forward language that would create uh, a, a process um, so that, and it would if a recommendation comes in, we put it, we put it on the city website how to make a nomination. And if a recommendation comes forward for a street naming or a, a park in, let's give an example, if it was in wards nine and 10, then automatically that, that nomination would be reviewed by the city staff, um, the regional and, and city councilor. And if supportive, it would, it would then go to council for ratification. But that way we create a process behind this recognition. And as we've seen through this exercise with a Dr. Joseph Rizal Park, there are opportunities. You look at this year, 2019, five new parks coming online that were having naming that had no significance to the community. And so th this is a healthy process to have. Um, and uh, I want to thank Councillor Dillon for recognizing that we needed to put a process behind it. And I think this is the one that would engage the ward councillors when it affects their um, their neighbourhood to make sure it's in the context of, of their wards. Uh, so Councillor Dillon and then Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so I think it's really important that we move forward with this. Um, I think it uh, when it comes back, I think we need to look into um, having an opportunity to, for the uh, for our residents to really feel like you know this is their city and it represents who they are. Uh, and so whether we're looking at people who have contributed to Brampton, to Ontario, to, uh, to Canada, I think that's uh, uh, something that's really important. And, um, you know, I've had an opportunity to, in the last four or five years, to go around uh, and look at some of our street names or some of our park names. And um, some of them, we really don't know what they are, who they represent. Uh -huh. And uh, we got a park 
named after a developer's son. And, and so um, I don't know how appropriate that is, um, but it is what it is. And so um, there, you know, whether it's Ride for Raja, somebody who's really done something for Brampton, I think that's important to uh, look into. And uh, an example is uh, Kamagata Maru Park. Um, we, we named it a couple years ago. We have the official uh, opening ceremony on uh, June 22nd, which we're really excited uh, about. And so that's something about Canadian history uh, that we're going to be celebrating. And, um, you know, there's some of the descendants from that ship live in Brampton. And so one of the organizers as well, their great, great uh, granddaughter lives in Brampton. So I think it's a, uh, something very special. But if we can expand on that and look at other opportunities in the city, I think uh, uh, it'll be really good for, for us going forward. Uh, Councillor uh, Williams. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor. Uh, you know, during Black History Month, we had done um, a similar process in order to identify historic um, black figures that had made an impact to Brampton. So, you know, uh, with an actual structure and a process, I think it's going to really help support that motion as well that we, we uh, brought forward in February. And, um, you know, I think we have... Brampton has such a diverse and um, it is a mosaic of many different cultures and community groups who have helped grow the city. So, you know, it, it's going to definitely boost the, the um, you know, just boost the way people feel about Brampton and encourage ownership over the city. So I, I fully support that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Medeiros. Uh, through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you, Councillor Dillon and, and the Mayor for bringing this forward. Um, and I, I think I expressed some of the concerns before when we were talking about the naming of the park and you know, I'm fully supportive of this. The, 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 only, the only thing I hope that we, uh, or this reference committee, uh, really keeps in mind as we celebrate our mosaic cultural heritage, um, I think we should not lose touch with our history of, uh, uh, of Brampton and its, and its, uh, and its heritage. And um, um, so it's important that as, as we do recognize, I guess, <coughs> individuals internationally, um, that we also recognize local uh, Brantonians over over the years who, um, you know, have, have made a significant contribution. So I, I, I'm, I don't know where that sweet spot is going to be, and I, I know this is going to be a, um, sometimes a, a, a controversial uh, sort of selection, but I, I hope we always look at um, recognizing locals and and individuals uh, from Brampton who have made a significant impact uh, uh, on Brampton. Thank you. Good point, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, Councillor Singh. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate this process and the thought behind it. I, I like the fact that uh, the councillors will be part of the committee too because we understand our communities. Uh, we knock the doors, we talk to the parks. Uh, we know in the community very well. so. I think that will allow for a more reflective process and one that really reflects the city. So I'm fully in support uh, of this motion. Thank you. Okay, I see no additional comments. Um, all those uh, in favor? Motion carries. Our next item uh, is 17.4, and this is um, an item that I uh, Placed on the agenda, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Willens, and if we could put the motion on the screen, um, and I'll explain the context behind this. Um, my uh, grandmother <coughs> is, uh, just turned uh, last uh, week uh, 105, uh, still sharp as anything, uh, and one thing that she's so proud of is that she was born in Ireland, and when she turned 100, she got sent. Uh, a medallion uh, from uh, from the government of, uh, of Ireland, even though she hasn't lived in Ireland since she was uh, a child. Uh, but they have a program that if you turn 100, you uh, are recognized with a, a coin from Ireland. Um, different cities, provinces, and countries have a recognition for turning 100. It doesn't happen very often. Um, it might be once or twice uh, if you're fortunate in a community to have someone turn um, that, uh, that age, uh, but I think it would be appropriate to have a recognition showing our uh, great admiration um, for uh, our elders. I would note my grandmother lives in the city of Toronto, so there's no 
conflict in uh, suggesting that, uh, um, but it, just seeing the pride in her eyes that her that 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 I, she has this medallion from Ireland that she now wears around her her neck. I just thought it was a beautiful uh, gesture of uh, appreciation, uh, and I thought it would be appropriate that we look at that in Brampton. A few weeks ago, I went to the birthday party of Ramesh Sangha, M MP Ramesh Sangha's father, who also turned 100, and the entire community was was out. Uh, there might have been four or 500 people at midnight celebrating his birthday, and it is special. Turning 100 is extraordinary. I think it's something that we could join in in, in, in celebrating, and um, I, I think it would be an insignificant cost to produce a medallion for the one or two residents that turn 100 each year, but it would be, um, I think, an appropriate gesture. So I know Councillor Willens um, had an example of what was done in the past. I thought that he could share that with, with, uh, with Council. So Councillor Willens. <clears throat> thank you through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for considering me to second the motion. Um, I can actually leave this with Peter Fay, if you like, as long as I get him back. These are commemorative coins that were done. Uh, one of them is for the 100 years of the town of Brampton. And this was actually this was actually monetary value back then for a certain amount of time celebrating Brampton's 100th anniversary. So I would show you some ideas. Maybe I can leave it with uh, Commissioner Patari. And this one is actually a, a, sam a sample of Canada Trust. Saw that plushie. Canada Trust selling with their 100th year from 87 to 1887 to 1987. So we can leave that with Council Plushie. <laughs> and maybe I would look at that. Give you some ideas of what we're thinking. And I think the, the mayor is thinking along the same lines mm -hmm. as a coin of some sort. Maybe we can put a monetary value to it of some sort, maybe for the, just those ones that do turn 100. But it gives you some ideas. If you want to pass, I don't know, if the councillors want to see it, they can pass it back and forth. <coughs> I, I wouldn't I'm going to try and pocket it. <laughs> but they were done, uh, it was quite, uh, the, the, the one that was a coin was actually, uh, um, Councillor Bowman remembers too, being one of the <coughs> oldest members here. <coughs> I don't expect to ever get one of these. <laughs> Be lucky if we get a 75th, but um, it gives you some ideas. Maybe staff can work with it. I'd appreciate to have some input on well as well. Thank you, Madam Mr. Yeah. Mayor. And as as always, thank you, Councillor Williams, for having a great uh, knowledge of uh, local history. Uh, that's uh, certainly an invaluable wealth of information. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Councillor Singh. Yeah, just for clarification, w um, would this be for residents born in Brampton but live? No. No, so it would be for residents who are residing in Brampton who have crossed off the okay. and, and the way it's That's done, just, I just want yeah, to clarify. So the way it's done in, um, in Ireland yeah. is that you have to apply. So if a oh, family okay. is having a birthday party, they could apply. And I think we would have discretion if someone lived in Brampton all their life but happened to be in a, uh, a, a long-term care facility yeah, in Vaughan, we would yeah. want to recognize their long history in Brampton. Yeah. If there's someone who moved here 20 years ago but is here with their family li proudly living in Brampton um, doesn't matter if they weren't born here yeah, yeah, Brampton's absolutely. their home so I, I think to have discretion to um, acknowledge yeah yeah and would, would you also prefer application process for the that's the way it's done else okay. elsewhere so I think it, it would have to be an application process it would be, be on the family's initiative yeah okay just want to clear yeah. thank you seen um, it, it pass these coins down for those that would like to, to look uh, see no other questions all those in favor motion carries okay the next item I also placed and this is uh, moved by myself and councillor Medeiros it will put this motion on the screen a common concern that has been raised uh, to the mayor's office and I'm sure you've heard it out in the community is we've got this beautiful diverse city but some of our efforts when it comes to um, telling the city's story to communicating um, uh, is lacking when it comes to multilingual and cultural uh, communications uh, I'd like to see a report back on how we could do better um, you know it was a few months ago we had the deputation from the Canadian Pakistan Media Association complaining uh, about that lack of a relationship and I think I've heard it across the board um, from communities. Brampton is not your traditional community. How you communicate to the media is different here. Um, it's not like some communities where there's one, um, there's, there's 
one newspaper that uh, is read by everyone. Um, we have a variety of, of, of news and media, and I think we need to do better uh, when it comes to how we communicate. I'd like to get a report back um, by July 1st to how we can uh, improve our, our, our performance. And we have, we have 23 social media accounts. We have 23 as a city, 23 social media accounts. I, I'd like to see some coordination uh, to that, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to see a plan put forward. So I'm not sure if there's questions to, 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 to that, but this would be a challenge to staff to report back to us on a plan um, uh, by July 1st. And so it gives them a month and a half to um, give us some guidelines. Councilor Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this looks a little bit different than what previous council um, decided to go in uh, in a different direction. So there was a there was a big price tag um, with the previous councils, uh, with the report that came to the previous council. Um, I I just like to understand kind of more in depth. So uh, by way of the report that comes back. Um, what what that all entails and uh, and what the cost of uh, of some of these items may be. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. And I, I'd also add in, we, in that report, I'd like to see what we spend currently on advertising and, and communications. What efforts are there? Um, if there's an initiative that is uh, of, um, if we're having the, this big Portuguese festival, what efforts are we doing in both English and Portuguese to get the message out about the event. If we had a recognition for um, the, the Tamil community, what efforts did we do in English and Tamil to get that message out? I've seen other cities uh, do a pretty sophisticated effort on that front, and, and I, I believe we can do better, but I also look at what we spend on communications, and we spend a fair amount on advertising and communications, and I think it's in fairness to council, we should get that breakdown and get a plan from staff of how we could uh, do better. We have a a new director of corporate communications, and uh, um, you know, I, I I think this could be an early assignment uh, to to, cut, to draw up a plan for council. So, if I if I may, um, now that this kind of scope has opened up a little bit, I just have a question about is uh, July first. Um, is that enough time um, for for the report to come back and um, universally uh, by way of Portuguese and and English. Two examples. So Portuguese chicken uh, says everything about. <laughs> so is that timeline? Through the chair, if I may, I was going to request that we amend the date to at least align with a meeting date of council so that we could have fulsome discussion on the report. Um, as the clerk had mentioned earlier, July 10th is in the calendar, albeit tentative. Uh, I would at least request July 10th so that uh, we have the time to bring it back and council have the and discussion. We'll, prob we'll probably add some more items to that July 10th meeting by the end of the day today. If Thanks. that's acceptable to council. Okay. So if we change that to July 10th. Okay. Councillor Singh. So um, I'm definitely supportive of uh, this motion to include more diverse uh, media um, what I would like to see in this report as well is criteria um, because just looking at specifically South Asian media um, it's extremely fragmented and there's probably dozens and dozens of outlets so how are we gonna pick and choose which outlets um, uh, that we're going to advertise in? I, I would um, like some thought behind that uh, because I can see that becoming a tricky uh, sort of area <laughs> from personal experience as well. So, <laughs> so um, as long as we have some clarity about how we're going to pick outlets, uh, yeah. just from experience. Yeah, and and that's what we'd expect to see in the in the report. Yeah. Obviously, um, you don't want to create a situation where you would be uh, having to communicate to a thousand different uh, small entities. It would be the ones that would be credible news organizations in the community yeah. that you'd want to have an ongoing dialogue with. Yeah, yeah so I, I find sometimes credibility is also in the eyes of the yeah. beholders. So that's another yeah. issue as well. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, see no other questions. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. 17.6. Uh, this is moved by Councillor Pertini, seconded by Councillor Vicente. said 17.6 yeah okay um so we have a 17.6 is now 17.7 and we have an item 17.6 by councillor Medeiros and santos councillor Medeiros. uh thank you as i appreciate uh councillor santos's <laughs> eagerness to discuss the issue i would um hope that she support if we can just defer this uh to next week's uh committee of council um referred sorry my apologies I'll let her speak. Thank you through you, Mayor. Um, I'm happy to support uh, the referral back to committee next week. Um, this was just my excuse to say the word youth this week because we've been doing it every single week. <laughs> okay, so this is referred. Um, our next item, oh, all in favor? <laughs> Our next item is from Councillor Fertini and Councillor uh, Vicente. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this was brought to us uh, by Di uh, Dinah Care. Uh, it was requested about naming the street, so we look at 17.3. Uh, so Dinah Care is one of the largest provider of laboratory service and top employer here in Ontario. Uh, besides Quebec, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia. So we're, not, we're requesting that uh, uh, the Zim, so maybe uh, the C she was a CEO from the city uh, of Brampton for 2005, for Dynacare from 2005 to 2018. Uh, and it, was a, it had a powerful impact uh, to economic care in the city of Brampton. So Dynacare has requested uh, if we could look at moving a sign and not, not the road, just underneath, just like we have like uh, in Toronto, Lombardi Way or uh, other streets underneath. So if we could do a, under the street, place a sign under the Madeira Court uh, where Dinah Care Brampton head office has requested to see if we could put it at the bottom of the name, just uh, in memory of her. And so we got the motion there. we we'll just report back to staff and bring it back. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Brown, staff will report back. Thank you. Okay, does Councilor Vicente want to speak to that as well? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to uh, add my support for the motion, uh, we had a visit from uh, representatives from Dynacare, and uh, they talked to us about uh, the significance and the importance of uh, Mrs. Nassim Samani on um, the uh, history of economic development here in the city of Brampton. And uh, we are a city that um, chooses to promote and celebrate business milestones. And um, Ms. Samani had a powerful impact on the success of Dynacare. Uh, they have been consistently over the past 15 years uh, considered and awarded for being top employers in the GTA and that reflects very proudly on Brampton's business heritage and so uh, I thank uh, Councillor Fertini for bringing forward the motion. Uh, just to clarify, um, Dynacare's head office and headquarters is located here in the city of Brampton on Midair Court and uh, they're not requesting to alter the name of Midair Court but they're asking for commemorative signs and commemorative street signs are commonplace in other municipalities where they have uh, policies established to uh, recognize uh, people who have had uh, significant uh, impacts on the municipality or the province or the country and so uh, I hope that uh, council will see this as an opportunity not only to honor Ms. Samani and her legacy but also to provide a, a framework for future opportunities where the city, in ex exceptional circumstances, chooses to uh, bestow this type of honor uh, on other individuals in the future. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think this is a great initiative. Uh, thank you uh, to Councillor uh, Fertini and uh, Vicente for uh, the suggestion. Um, Councillor Dillon. Um, sorry, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was under the impression that the, the, the street naming uh, we passed before, uh, the, for staff to report back on, included um, ceremonial street names. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, in response to Mrs. Councilor Dillon's question, so staff, with a report that we will be bringing back, we'll be looking at the matter. Uh, we'll be uh, reporting back to Council to advise on really the, what we found. We, we do have to have some discussions with the Street Naming Committee about uh, just the use generally of the secondary names, and, and we'll be confirming really at that point in time back to Council as to how we can utilize the secondary street names the logistics behind those things, and then more particularly as it could apply to mid-air court here. So, but that, is that motion, the motion that we passed or first half to report back, is this already included in that, what this is asking? So, uh, Councillor Dillon, the motion that was passed wasn't asking for a staff report back, it was to create uh, the committee, where this oh. one is asking staff to do a, Report. And I agree that it could fall in under the under the the committee, but I think my sense is that maybe Councillor Vicente and Councillor Bertini wanted to put some urgency on this, and we didn't actually coordinate. Um, they they were they didn't realize that our motion was coming when this one was drafted. Okay. Sorry, you guys speak. Sure. Yes, Councillor Vicente to answer. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair, to Councillor Dillon and question. The motion that we approved under 17.3 is fundamentally different from this one in the sense that um, under street naming and cultural recognition, that is for newly established roads and streets and avenues, whereas this motion is not asking to rename the street or to name the street, it is asking for the placement of commemorative signage, as Councillor Fortini mentioned. There is precedent for this in other municipalities. For example, a very famous and well-known example on College Street in Toronto. They established and honored an individual. His name was Johnny Lombardi, who had significant cultural and uh, economic impacts in that city. And they honored uh, that person to um, and recognized him on College Street. And so Midair Court, as it is, are, is already an established area. Uh, there are other businesses that share the street. Um, the idea here is for us to establish a framework for commemorative signage where it might be requested by members of the community. It's not to rename the street or to name a new street. So the discussion, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, is the discussions that we had, um, sorry, that the, the mayor and I have also included ceremonial street names uh, as well. Um, for example, there's been uh, a few in Mississauga that we talked about where it put the, uh, sorry, in Toronto uh, and other major cities that we talked about where they, um, you know, for example, New York might be Fifth Avenue, it's called, you know, underneath it, there's a sign that says, you know, somebody's name Way or somebody's name Boulevard. And so uh, I'm just wondering if that was captured, if what this is asking is also captured uh, in that, so we'll through, be captured in that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the staff is understanding that the, through the conversation that we had prior that commemorative street names are, are also to be looked at really through that initiative. And so planning staff and engineering staff will be looking at the totality of really how we can commemorate, uh, including the, the ceremonial street names. Staff will be though reporting back just you know, as per this motion to, to respond to this matter in particular. Uh, beyond looking at the matter more generally and procedurally through the, through the other matter. Okay. Councillor Fertini on this point? Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. I, I, would just, I would just add that uh, perhaps uh, 
Nassim Somani Way could be the first of what will be many examples in the future. Thank you. Okay. So, all those in favor? Motion uh, carries. Okay, and we have the next item. Yes, yes, put that on the screen, the motion. So this is a housekeeping motion moved by myself, seconded by Councillor uh, Fortini. Seeing no uh, discussion, all those in favor? A chance to read it? Yeah. Okay, Councillor Dillon? Sorry, just uh, who, who is Suzanne Craig? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Suzanne Craig is the current Temporary Integrity Commissioner the Council appointed back in March um, as the City was in, uh, undergoing a procurement process. A, an Integrity Commissioner is a required position uh, under the Municipal Act, so until such time as Council has appointed a new Integrity Commissioner, uh, Clause 3 is, is recommending that Suzanne Craig continue to be appointed as a Temporary Integrity Commissioner. I have. Um, spoken with Suzanne Craig and she, she originally was appointed to the end of May and she is willing to continue in this appointment until Council appoints a new Integrity Commissioner. So we're calling a, a new, uh, uh, for a new proposal to call for proposal for a new um, Integrity Commissioner and we're essentially keeping her on as interim in the meantime. Through you, Mr. Mayor, this is uh, initiating a recruitment process for an Integrity Commissioner and Lobbyist Registrar. Okay. And in the meantime, uh, maintaining Suzanne Craig as the Temporary Integrity Commissioner. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. All those in favor? Motion carries. Our next item. Now, I, I believe Councillor Plushy had an added item, but that's in camera. Okay. Okay, public question period. Please come to the mic, state your name. Hello, my name is Sylvia, um, I'm a resident. So this is sort of on the referred matters list and partial and government relations matters. Yesterday the Premier announced money for cities to do financial audits. Um, the city passed a motion to do an audit in December and we were told that it was going to come back before the budgeting process. I think it's coming back next week. Is there the possibility to use some of that money to audit why your audit took twice as long as we thought it would take when the parent, when the mayor was told that by KPMG that it would be done before the budget and it's way past that? Uh, so uh, let me have the CEO speak to, uh, to, to that. Thank you. To you, Chair. We did provide an update to Council from KPMG in line with our budget process in terms of any uh, opportunities to adjust and support our budgetary process. And I believe that assisted with uh, getting us to that 0% uh, uh, increase that Council endorsed unanimously. Um, this is the full report that's coming next week, which outlines a series of further opportunities beyond what was uh, added to our budget process for 2019 that will require further discussion, deliberation, and thoughtful feasibility assessment as those opportunities um, are, could be relatively significant and they require council <coughs> feedback and input to that process. So that is what is coming forward uh, next week. 
as well. Uh, there will be additional work in terms of those uh, assessments that we're looking for, and we are considering going to the province and asking whether or not they would fund some of those deeper dive uh, reports as well to try and leverage that. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, I would just note that uh, uh, given the chorus of disappointment over um, the cuts to municipalities across the province, from everything from childcare to prisoner transport, uh, uh, the province's response, uh, in particular to the city of Toronto, which uh, has been leading uh, the, the charge against the, the cuts, was instead of offering uh, to say that they weren't going to cut as, as deep. The response was, uh, we'll give you funding to do value for money audits to reduce your budgets by 4%, um, which the extent of that would be uh, pretty drastic. I would note the money provided by the province um, would cover value for money audits for about 10 municipalities of the 180. And so I think it was more of a communications tool than it was a meaningful um, uh, opportunity for municipalities. Having said that, if we can get part of our value for money audit costs recouped, then I think that we, we, would, we would welcome that. And frankly, when the province says municipalities should do value for money audits, well, Brampton was doing that before anyone suggested that. Uh, that was the, the very first thing that this council did. I remember Councillor Harkirat Singh putting that motion forward, understanding that we wanted to watch every, uh, every penny spent. So thank you for the suggestion. Uh, seeing no other members uh, of the public, um, we are now at the portion of the meeting dealing with adoption of city bylaws to give effect to council decisions made at this meeting and in previous meetings. I have a motion from Councillor Bowman, seconded by Councillor Willens, to approve the bylaws. All those in favor? Motion carries. Our next item of business is item 21, closed session business. I have a motion uh, by uh, Councillor Willens, seconded by Councillor uh, Bowman. The Council proceed into closed session to discuss matters pertaining to the following. Minutes closed session, Citizen Appointments Committee, April 3rd, April 9th, 12th, 23rd, 26th, May 13th. Minutes closed session, City Council. Minutes closed session, Committee of Council. Sorry. And the item, item on the screen, uh, security of property of the municipality or local board and a position and plan for procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on behalf of the municipality. Moved by Councillor Will and seconded by Councillor Bowman. All those in favor? And uh, to take, a, take a lunch break. So why don't we say ret uh, returning camera at 1 o'clock? At the sixth floor. business. As a result of our closed session today, I wish to report the following. We have the minutes closed session Citizen Appointments Committee April 3rd, 9th, 12th, 23rd, 26th, and May 13th. This item was considered in closed session and direction was given to consider the following appoint appointment motions in public session. Will this go on the screen? Okay. So Mr. Mayor, members of council, there are uh, appointments for eight different committees. The first is the Accessibility Advisory Committee, and, and Council can take one vote on this. Okay, I have a motion from Councillor Fertini, seconded by Councillor Medeiros. Uh -huh. Can you see it now? Okay. Um, do you want to see all the committees? See the sports hall. Of, see all the committee sports hall of fame. I'm going to scroll down. Environment advisory committee. School traffic safety council. Community safety advisory committee. Age friendly advisory committee, and the Brampton Heritage Board. Moved 
by Councillor Pertini, second by Councillor Maduros. All those in favor? Motion carries. Councillor on the board. Okay, I don't have the board up here anymore. Well, just take the screen. Yes. Right, come on. Councillor Vicente? Thank you, through you, Mayor. Just a uh, clarification from staff. Uh, voted for the motion. That's good. Um, will the city be uh, communicating these names and all of the other committee uh, membership, but also uh, arranging for uh, a media release that includes uh, a photo of the members uh, so that the public are aware of uh, the counts of these committees? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, emails are planned to go today or tomorrow morning to all the um, appointed applicants to congratulate them and welcome them to their appointment to their respective committee. Uh, also, there will be emails going out to all the other applicants that did apply who were not successful, but uh, advising of future opportunities that may come forward. And once we do orientation sessions for each of these committees, uh, we do plan to do group photos for each of the committee compositions and get their consent to make that information available on the city's website along with a short bio on each of the members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, motion is carried. These, we also have 21.2 minutes closed session City Council May 8th. These minutes were acknowledged by Council. 21.3 minutes closed session Committee of Council May 15th. These minutes were acknowledged by Council. That brings us oh, 21.3. 21.4, the added item by Councillor Pileshi, direction was given. Uh, that takes us to 22.1. Our next item of business, the confirming bylaw. I have a motion by Councillor Willen, second by Councillor Bowman, uh, to approve the confirming bylaw to confirm the proceedings and decisions from this meeting. All those in favor? Motion carries. The Council, uh, our last item of business is adjournment. Uh, so thank you, Council members, for. A productive meeting. Council is next scheduled to meet June 5th and after that June 19th at 9.30 a.m. I have a motion from Councillor Bowman, seconded by Councillor Willens. All those in favor of adjourning this meeting? I got some hands. We have two hands. More of you want to adjourn than that. Okay. Motion carries. <laughs>